Can everybody hear me? <clears throat> yes, good. Hello. A very, very, very warm welcome to everybody who's managed to make it here today. Um, it's, uh, it's fantastic to be here in person for the Genetic Society's uh, summer garden party and celebration. So thanks for coming in what are difficult times and there's still some people stuck on the M25. Uh, I know that there are lots of people uh, online. Uh, this is being streamed um, and you can follow us on Twitter at hashtag Mendel 200 Gensoc. Um, I also, also we have a lot of people off with COVID, which means that there are some places at dinner uh, uh, for anybody who hasn't registered for dinner um, on the Genetic Society. So I hope those who haven't can, can stay and, and, and join us um, for pea-related food. Uh, and, um, um, and of course, yeah, hopefully, hopefully trains are going to be running properly. It's going to be cooler today, I think. Um, thanks for coming to this beautiful site, um, which is just awesome, stunning, uh, and a great place to be celebrating the contribution of plants to the discipline. Um, citrus out there, all kinds of wonderful, wonderful things growing. Um, and at five o'clock, the, um, uh, the garden's closed to the public and we have it all to ourselves so we can dance naked on the grass and go around on, uh, go around in, um, uh, there's a the little, there's a trolley, a train thing that can take us on a tour for those who don't want to, want to walk, but the gardens are just phenomenal. So thanks to, to RHS Wisley for having us here today and to the team for, for, um, for supporting this event. Um, I'd like to thank, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Kay Branfield, without whom this event would just not have happened at all. Normally we do thank yous at the end. This is one thank you that I want to do at the beginning because we wouldn't be here without Kay, so thank you Kay. Um, so today's special because it's the 200th birthday today of Gregor Mendel, that polymath monk from Bruneau, um, whose work on the inheritance of phenotype um, has given rise to the discipline of genetics. I'm not going to give a lecture on Mendelian laws of inheritance. We're going to hear more about Mendel uh, later in a minute. Um, but I want to um, acknowledge his remarkable work, um, remind ourselves how good Jonathan Pettit looked dressed up as Mendel at the Chelsea Flower Show for our 100th anniversary a few years ago. Where's Jonathan? <laughs> See, he still looks a bit like, he still looks like, he still looks like Mendel. Um, and, um, and to remind you that the, our, our journal Heredity um, has this month published a set of articles focusing on exceptions to the Mendelian laws of inheritance that I'd encourage you to have a read of. And actually, during the course of the <coughs> development and preparations of that, um, uh, of that edition, we decided that we would have a school's competition uh, uh, for artwork from students that was inspired by Mendel. Um, and this one uh, is the winner. It's by um, Lily McKiernan, uh, who's 14, from uh, Bishop's Hatfields Girls' School. Uh, the student gets 100 pounds and the school gets 500 pounds. But actually, as you'll see from the, from the brochure, there have been some fantastic um, uh, pieces of art that I think have formed a, the composite of, the new, uh, of, of, this, of this particular issue. And thanks to Christina uh, Fonseca for organizing um, um, the, this competition, which was <laughs> really lovely, actually. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have any hard copies of that uh, issue this, this, uh, yet. Um, they're they're, they're, on, they're on, their, on their way to the publisher, uh, but you can check out the, um, um, the edition online. Um, let's see, what else? Ah, branding. Today, uh, I get to announce the Genetic Society's new branding. Um, so the color scheme is um, uh, on these uh, things here and on all the sort of well, they're not merchandising because we're not selling them, but, you know, stuff, genetic society stuff. Um, and it's now, it's our new, we have a new website uh, and, um, and it will be on, all our, on, on our newsletter. Um, and that's a, a very exciting um, transformation, refresh, uh, that's coinciding with, uh, with, with today. Second, I'd like to, uh, actually, finally, I'd like to announce uh, 
a new award for uh, PhD students. Um, this is the Katanak Award uh, in honour of the late Bruce Katanak, who was uh, a remarkable mouse geneticist uh, and who actually was co-discoverer of genomic imprinting, which we're going to hear about, uh, hear about today. Um, this is an award for a, a PhD thesis uh, in a, uh, uh, on genetics in a model system. Uh, and the award is, uh, is from the Mouse Newsletter in collaboration with the Genetics Society. So um, we're very glad to have that award. And you can find more information on that in the, on the website. Okay, um, today we're also going to celebrate and hear from some awardees of Genetics Society medals and prizes. Um, um, more for that from them later. Um, and this year, I have to say, we've awarded the Mendel Lecture and Medal to not one, but two people. And I'll say more about that later. Um, but finally, I just want to say that um, we're not alone in celebrating today. So all over uh, the country, well, not all over the country, but in lots of places in the country and abroad, others are celebrating uh, Mendel's 200th uh, anniversary. Uh, and at 4.30 today, we'll be having cake and we will not be alone. Other people will also, in other venues, will also be celebrating with a special cake. So um, uh, a great day for genetics. Uh, feel the vibes of the other places, uh, Bruneau, Bristol, uh, and, um, and enjoy the day and the beautiful gardens. So um, our f I'm going to introduce our first speaker. And our first speaker is uh, Alison Woolard. Um, Alison uh, has recently finished her term as a, a much valued member of the Genetic Society Committee as Officer for, for Public Engagement of Genetics. She is renowned for her uh, public communication of science, uh, uh, but her day job is Associate Professor of Biochemistry at Oxford, uh, where she's a developmental and cellular genetics geneticist. Alison gave the uh, Royal Institution Christmas Lectures in 2013, and today she's going to initiate our special day uh, with a presentation entitled Mendel to Modern Day Genetics. Over to you, Alison. <coughs> so, thank you very much, Anne. Um, and I'd just like to thank the Genetic Society for the opportunity and the honour of talking about Mendel um, at, this 20th, at this 200th anniversary celebration that's been put together by the society. So the first thing I want to say is that I'm a practicing geneticist and I'm not a historian of genetic science. So in what I'm going to tell you today, I've borrowed heavily from the prevailing literature, and especially the wonderful work of Daniel Fairbanks at Utah Valley University. And I think Daniel's probably speaking today um, at the celebration in Bruneau. So, um, uh, you know, his, his work is really some of the most detailed historical record about Mendel and his impact. Um, and in fact, so much has been written about Mendel and his work that actually I feel a bit of a fraud trying to bring it all together for you here. And so I need you to forgive me the odd inaccuracy, naivety or other defects um, in this talk. So um, I want to start with Darwin, really, and talk about the problem with Darwin's great idea. So Darwin's idea, of course, was that variation among creatures in their natural environment results in a struggle for life and only the most suitably adapted are preserved. But Darwin had no mechanism to explain inheritance, and this rendered his logic incomplete. His unifying theory failed in this respect. So Darwin knew that, um, that traits run in families, otherwise natural selection wouldn't work at all, but he had no dis decent mechanism to explain how inheritance work works, despite recognizing the supreme importance of heredity because of his modification by descent hypothesis. But his work, Darwin's work, didn't lead to any new way of solving the central mystery of life, so how organisms reproduce and pass down characteristics. In other words, um, the famous saying, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, I think has an addendum, which is nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of genetics. So what were the prevailing theories of heredity in Darwin's day? I'm going to start with the earliest known writings on this subject, and that's Hippocrates in 400 BC. So Hippocrates believed that reproductive material came from all parts of an organism, and hence that characteristics were directly handed down to the progeny. And as evidence in support of this, he referred to an ancient tribe of man mankind called the macrocephaly. 
And you can see in this um, skull here, immediately after a child was born, the macrocephaly fashioned its head um, by hand to give it an elongated shape. And then at a later period, um, the idea became um, accepted that the elongated head would form naturally without the necessity for moulding it after birth, uh, in much the same way that baldness and blue eyes are inherited. So if reproductive material came from all parts of an organism, then it would come from the moulded head. That was the idea at the time. And then 50 years or so later than Hippocrates, Aristotle questioned this view. So Aristotle couldn't understand how certain characteristics such as voice and nails and hair could contribute to the reproductive material because they seem intangible or concern dead tissue. And he also observed that children often resembled their grandparents more um, than their parents. And Aristotle was puzzled about plants. So how could parts which may be absent at the time of reproduction, like leaves, for example, be inherited? And how could it be that parents e could each contribute something from all of their parts, and yet the progeny have only one and not two of everything? So Aristotle modelled Hippocrates' theory by postulating that the reproductive material is made up of substances that have been diverted from various parts to the reproductive part. And that was a really important idea because it, it, gave, it paved the way for people to talk about the germline as being something separate. So Aristotle then went on to argue that the contributions to the progeny from two parents were not the same. And he held the contribution of the father in somewhat higher regard. No surprises there. And he thought that the contribution of the father contributed shape and form to the embryo and that the mother's contribution was the inner material. In other words, all the boring stuff. Many variants of these transmission theories uh, were proposed over the subsequent centuries. And the only theory of heredity that's perhaps rivaled it is the so-called preformation theory that can be followed back to St. Augustine. And this theory held that in the creation of the first woman, all following generations were preformed. And the theory gave rise to the idea of the homunculus in the 16th century. Although Nicholas Hartziker, who drew this homunculus, in 1695 was definitely a spermist in his view of heredity. But it was really the transmission theories that dominated during Darwin's time. And so Darwin, writing in 1868, um, in his paper, Animals, The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication, um, and he wrote about his theory of pangenesis in this paper. And he suggested that all the cells and tissues of an organism threw off minute granules called gemmules, and they circulated through the organism, they multiplied, and they were passed down to the reproductive cells, which thus contained a multitude of components thrown off um, from each individual part of the organism. He also thought that the gemmules must be capable of transmission in a dormant state to future generations. And he felt that pangenesis, which he described as a provisional hypothesis in this 1868 work, brought together, nine years after the origin of species, in his words, a multitude of facts which are at present left disconnected by any cause. But actually, his theory was not so very different from that of Hippocrates over 2,000 years previously. It's remarkable that the Hippocratic view remained essentially unchallenged for 23 centuries. It's not as though no one did any breeding experiments during this time, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries. It's more the case that although these experiments did not support the classical view, they didn't present any alternative hypotheses. So it's note we're now we've fast forwarded we're, well, well we far, fast forwarded from the ancients um, to several decades before Mendel published his work, and there are at least two other plant breeders who made very similar observations to Mendel. So the first is Thomas Andrew Knight, shown here, who lived from 1759 to 1838. He had an FRS. He hailed from Downton Castle in Herefordshire, and he was the second president of the Royal Horticultural Society. So that's one of the many links to the Royal Horticultural Society that we find we need to think about today. A knight performed extensive breeding experiments on strawberries and cabbages and peas in his extensive curvilinear greenhouse. Um, so in, in 1799, Goss did the experiment of crossing unpigmented and pigmented edible peas together. He did this experiment. And he was surprised to find only pigmented plants the following year, in the 
F1 generation. And when he um, allowed these to self, they produced both pigmented and unpigmented plants in the, in the following generation. So from this, Knight deduced that there was a stronger tendency to produce coloured than colourless plants. And he left it at that. And then um, there was John Goss, who was also working in England, and in 1824 made some sim similar discoveries. I couldn't find pictures of Goss easily online. Um, he was not aristocracy. He hailed from Devon. He was a lad who cleaned boots and did other odd jobs at the, ret at the rectory in Idsley. And there, the rector noticed his obvious intelligence and his inventive skills, and he helped to educate him. And John Goss um, was a bit of an inventor. Uh, he, he made a very early calculating machine, and he also made an orrery, which is a model of the solar system as a way of trying to engage his, village, his villagers in wanting to understand more about the world around them. But John Goss had a very lucky break when he um, helped a lady who had fallen out of a carriage near to where he lived. And that lady was, was of aristocracy, Lady Harrington, and um, they fell in love. He helped her up from a fall and he ended up marrying her. And this union enabled him to concentrate on plant breeding experiments because he didn't need to worry about money anymore. And he sent this note to his um, experiments um, on yellow-green seeded var varieties of pea. He called the green blue, but it's, the, it's really the green phenotype that Mendel late, later worked on. And this, is, again, is a paper to the, um, to the RHS. It's called the Horticultural Society of London in those days. So his paper was called On the Variation in the Colour of Peas Occasioned by Cross Impregnation. Um, so what Goss did was to... Um, Oh, I should say, his, his, um, his, his, his paper um, contains an, a very interesting prophetic sentence. Um, Should this new variety of pea neither possess superior merit nor be deemed singular in its bicoloured bi produce, yet there is, I conceive, something in its history that will emit a ray of physiological light. So he, he had insight that these peas were kind of, a, kind of cool and could tell us interesting things. And what he basically did was to take Knight's analysis a bit further. So he pollinated green seeded plants from a yellow seeded variety, found all yellow seeded plants in the first generation, and then when he selfed those, he got pods with all green, all yellow, or a mixture of both green and yellow seeds, um, seed, seeded plants the following year. But then he went for a further generation, and he discovered that while the green peas bred true, only giving green progeny, the yellow yielded a mixture, some pods all yellow, and some with both green and yellow peas intermixed. So these, these patterns had been observed, but the problem with both Knight and Goss, and others who were doing similar experiments at the same time, is they didn't count the number of the two kinds of peas, or if they did count them, they failed to see the significance of those numbers. And in not doing so, they failed to discover the hereditary mechanism which Mendel found. So, 42 years later then, in 1866, Mendel had been doing similar experiments to those of Knight and Goss. But how and why did Mendel come to be doing this? So, in a nutshell, brief biography of um, Mendel. And this was recently reviewed in a really excellent article by Daniel Fairbanks in the special issue of Heredity that um, Anne mentioned. Whoops, gone ahead. Mendel rose from impoverished childhood in a, in a small village in, called Heitzendorf in what was Austrian Silesia, it's now the Czech Republic. He was the son of peasant farmers, and he rose from this to become a successful teacher, scientist, priest, and ultimately prelate and abbot. The, the evidence around Mendel's discoveries is unfortunately highly fragmentary because much of the original documentation was either lost or destroyed. Um, probably because the, the, his fellow friars, when he died, just didn't realise that his work was particularly significant and they just thought it needed tidying up. And into this void has appeared various unfounded suppositions, including assertions that he never articulated the principles ascribed to him, that he opposed Darwin, and that he falsified data. And we'll come to some of this later. Um, he was baptised Johann um, Mendel, and he was the second of five children, not all of whom survived to adulthood. But his sister, Theresia, did, leave, did live 
to see her brother Gregor. He was, took the name Gregor when he was ordained. Um, she did see him attain fame as the founder of genetics in the early 20th century. So Mendel went to, uh, very trigger happy. Mendel went to a boarding school for gifted children in Leipnik, and then he went to the Troppau Gymnasium, and from there to the Olmutz Philosophical Institute, where he graduated in 1843 at the age of 21. He was very keen on physics, and as well as natural history, and he shined in both, and it was his physics professor who recommended him for admission to the Augustinian order in the St. Thomas's Monastery in Brunn, now called Brno, um, that we can see here. And it's really important that, that Mendel was a friar and not a monk, because the friars openly served the community as teachers um, and so on. The St. Thomas's friars were really unusual as well in that they were highly educated, with several dedicated to secular academic teaching and research. So this is a really important part of the milieu um, to which um, Mendel became part of. The abbot, Cyril Knapp, was a highly respected scholar committed to implementing scientific advances in agriculture, and he really encouraged Mendel in this area. So that gives you quite a lot of the background of the why Mendel was thinking about these particular problems. Met several openings came up for parish priests um, during this time, but Mendel showed himself to be really unsuitable for them. He was terrified of talking to people who were sick, for example. And so Knapp recommended him for a teaching position at the, at the Znaim Gymnasium southwest of Brunn. And he was a brilliant teacher, but he fell foul of new rules about qualifications for teachers and had an absolute nightmare trying to pass exams in physics and natural history in Vienna. And he, he, he made several attempts at these exams, as we shall see. By the time his exam reports received, were received by the monastery the first time around, though, Knapp, um, the abbot, had already sent Mendel off to study at the University of Vienna in preparation for a teaching career. And this was another really important part of Mendel's development as a scientist because he studied under Franz Unger. And Unger was a botanist and paleontologist who, in 1851, so eight years before Darwin published his work, Unger had a concept of evolution remarkably like Darwin's, um, even though that work was eight years from publication. So Mendel wrote various papers while he was working under Unger. He, for example, wrote um, some very big compilations of meteorolo meteorological data, very keen on data. Um, he also worked on lepidopteran predation in radishes, and he worked on pea weevils and how they infest pea seeds. Um, he returned to Bruneau in 1853, and um, just in time for it to be investigated but for secularism and lack of religious piety um, in a commission set up by the then Pope Pius IX. And the upshot was that the investigation concluded that the monastery should be dissolved. But luckily, this never happened. Well, it must have been a bit of a cloud for the intellectual friars to live under. And this cloud coincided with Mendel's earliest known P experiments. He had another go at his teaching certification in 1885, 1856, traveling back to Vienna for the written and oral exams, but he was taken ill during these exams, some sort of nervous attack, and abandoned them. So there's a story that uh, Mendel failed the exams because he argued with Fenzel, who was another botanist, about whether inheritance in plants is biparental or um, paternal. But actually, that's not true. That's a made-up story. He, f he, he failed the exams because he was taken ill during them. But it is known that Unger, um, Mendel's supervisor, Unger and Fenzel argued about the nature of fertilization and that Mendel was thinking about ways to test this to test, to try to uncover more about fertilization in his P experimental design. And he did some preliminary experiments in 1854 and 1855. I couldn't help putting a, a picture of Jonathan. Um, as Anne said, Jonathan is, an, is, a, is a sort of double of, of Mendel. And this is Jonathan um, being Mendel at the Society's um, exhibition at the... Um, Chelsea Flower Show in 2019, where we had um, an, a, a, an, an installation, I guess, called The Flowering of Genetics, which was great fun to do. 
So rather than just show a load of old photos of Mendel, I thought it'd be nice to put one of Jonathan in there as well. So apart from this interest in fertilization, then another motivation for Mendel's experiments was that the origin of species was such a central question at that time. And the hybridization between variants was thought to have an important role in this. Sometimes hybrids bred true, and other times they didn't. And Mendel was very curious about this. And also he came from an agricultural area. He came from a farming family and a farming culture. And so for him, it probably wasn't just about the basic science. It was also about the application of that understanding to the real world, to the rural economy, for example. And I think it's fascinating that this interest and observation of variation in domestic plants is very similar to the observations that Darwin made about the variation in domestic animals. So they were both inspired by variation in the natural world, very much so. Mendel carried out his hybridization experiments over eight years, between 1856 and 1863, not least because he had time to, given that his, he had failed in his teacher accreditation. So this really was a case of those who can teach, those who can't research. He gave two lectures on his work in 1865. And this, this is an interesting year as well. I was talking to Kim Naismith on the stairs the other day, and Kim's written a really nice article about Mendel as well recently. And um, Kim pointed out to me that 1865, the year that Mendel... Um, first lectured on this work, was the very same year that James Clerk Maxwell published his paper on the dynamical theory of the electromagnetic field. And this is, of course, remarkable because Mendel founded genetics and Maxwell arguably founded the field of macromolecular structure determination um, and their twin methodological pillars of modern bioscience. So that was a nice connection. So Mendel's, this is a page, one of the few um, pages from his notebook that's, that, that, that we can see. His thoroughness in recording the minutiae of his data enabled Mendel by a stroke of genius to detect the underlying mechanism and so put forward an entirely new hypothesis for heredity. The grandeur in Mendel's work is easily obscured by seemingly ob uh, obscured facts and figures about pea breeding schemes, but on the contrary, the devil is absolutely in the detail. The grandeur is revealed by the seemingly mundane, and we do need to spend a, lot of a, li a little bit of time on, the, on these facts and figures for the next few minutes. So working with the pigmented and unpig unpigmented peas, just like knights, Mendel also noted that pigmented plants in the F1 generation were, were the only ones he saw, and that on self-pollination, these plants yielded both pigmented and unpigmented varieties in the F2 but he counted them. He found 705 pigmented plants and 224 unpigmented plants among 929 plants. So he observed that these frequencies were close to one, three quarters and one quarter of the total. He called the pigmented character dominant and the unpigmented character recessive. In other words, he was saying that inheritance is particulate, not a case of blending parental characteristics like mixing paint. And importantly, the results were the same if the cross was done the other way around. In fact, one of Mendel's most important contributions is often overlooked, his definitive resolution of the Unger-Fenzel dispute. If you remember Ungel, who was, um, Unger, who was Mendel's mentor in Vienna, and Fenzel, who was also a professor of botany, they argued about whether inheritance was biparental or paternal. Mendel concluded that one germ cell and one pollen cell unite into a single cell that is able to develop an independent organism through the uptake of matter and the formation of new cells. This development takes place according to a constant law that is founded in the material nature and arrangement of the elements. And to the term single cell in his paper, he attached the following footnote, which is worth looking at. With PSOM, it's shown without doubt that there must be a complete union of the elements of both fertilizing cells for the formation of the new embryo. How could one otherwise explain that among the progeny of hybrids, both original forms reappear in equal numbers and with all their peculiarities? If the influence of the germ cell on the pollen cell were only external, if it were given only the role of a nurse, then the result of every artificial fertilization could be only that the developed hybrid was, exclu was exclusively like the pollen plant 
or was very similar to it. In no manner have experiments until now confirmed that. Fundamental evidence for the complete union of the contents of both cells lies in the universally confirmed experience that it is unimportant for the form of the hybrid which of the original forms was the seed or the pollen plant. A few years later, after Mendel published his 1866 classical paper, he annotated his copy of, the Dar of Darwin's Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication, in which Darwin had suggested that fertilization of a single germ cell requires more than one pollen grain. He annotated that, and he wrote down his annotations in a letter to um, fellow scientist Carl von Nageli. And he says to Carl von Nageli, I used Mirabilis jalapa, and that's the plant you can see here, it's a four o'clock plant. I used Mirabilis jalapa for an experimental plant as Norda, whose work Darwin was commenting on, had done. The result of my experiment, however, is completely different. From fertilization with single pollen grains, I obtained 18 well-developed seeds, and from these, an equal number of plants, of which 10 are already in bloom. According to Noda, at least three pollen grains are needed. So the killer experiment that Mendel conducted on Mirabilis was on account of its very large pollen grains. And the experiment was to pollinate with two pollen grains, each from a variety with different flower color, a double mixed pollination. So this was a really good experimental design that revealed Men Mendel's clarity of thinking. He realized that experiments with a single pollen grain would only show that a single pollen grain was sufficient for fertilization. But he needed to show that two can't both be involved. Only one fertilizes the egg. Later, of course, the microscopist confirmed the concept that two gametes unite at fertilization to form a zygote. But only very rarely is Mendel credited with his experimental confirmation of this, or the fact that he viewed this experiment as one of his most important achievements. So Mendel um, also worked on the yellow-green pea seed, seed color characteristic first explored by Goss, and he confirmed that yellow is dominant to green and that both kinds reappear in the second generation after crossing, but again, he counted his peas. And out of 8,000 odd plants, whoops, out of 8,000 odd plants, 6,022 were yellow and 2,001 were green. Again, a close approximation to three quarters to one quarter or three to one. Mendel confirmed Goss's observation that the green peas bred true, but he went much further. Mendel realized that not all the yellow pods were the same. He found that of 519 yellow pods, 166 bred true, whereas 353 did not instead giving yellow and green seeds in the same three-to-one ratio as in the previous generation. So Mendel figured that the 166 to 353 was a close fit with one-thirds to two-thirds of the total. So in other words, the F2 ratio of three dominant to one recessive was really a ratio of one pure breeding dominant to two impure dominant to one recessive, which always breeds true. He pursued these plants for several generations and showed that the pure breeding types always remained pure breeding and the impure breeding ones gave the same one to two to one ratio in each subsequent generation. Now Mendel was very cautious about his data and he went on to repeat his experiments with a total of seven different character differences. One character is always dominant to its alternative and the second generation always gave a three to one ratio which on closer inspection turned out to be a disguised one to two to one ratio. So these are the seven characteristics he worked on. He very deliberately focused on traits that differed in an all or nothing manner, round, wrinkled, yellow, green, and so on. And he was also sensible to focus on seeds where possible, because this saved time. He didn't need to grow the plants to see the phenotype. And of course, he could self or cross at will. He also well understood the potential confounding variable of the pea weevil, which he'd worked on in Vienna. And the pea weevil could have been responsible for insect pollination. So Mendel compared results obtained outside with those in his controlled environment of his greenhouse. So it's very easy to detect all the nuggets of outstanding experimental design in Mendel's work. We don't know to what extent he chose these traits for their clear dominance recessive relationships um, after extensive research or whether he simply got lucky with the single gene traits. 
Perhaps this seems unlikely, and it's also true that we know that Mendel was spending two or three years in preliminary experiments before he embarked on his main schemes. The seven characteristics he chose have often been the subject of speculation themselves. Indeed, Bateson himself, the co-founder of the Genetic Society, he wrote, it's very unlikely that Mendel could have had seven pairs of varieties such that the members of each pair differed from each other in only one considerable character. But this was debunked by Fisher, who wrote, there can, I believe, be no doubt whatever that his report is to be taken entirely literally and that his experiments were carried out in just the way and in much the order that they, have, that they are recounted. There's been extensively, this has been extensively researched by Fairbanks um, and Ritting in 2001, who examined the published characteristics of 19th century pea varieties and concluded that the nature of variation in pea varieties, both old and modern, facilitates rather than prevents the construction of monohybrid experiments. And furthermore, that Mendel's account describes a well-conceived experimental design that would not have been difficult for him to perform. We know that Mendel was performing preliminary experiments in 1853 and 1854, as I said, when he was trying to keep his head down um, as the zealots were investigating the monastery. But he's probably spent, thought his time spent in the greenhouse is time well spent. And Mendel was worrying about his, his teaching exams as well. Um, he was, but he was a very good experimentalist. So how did he interpret his ratios? Published his classic paper in 1866, and in this, he builds a hypothesis to account for his data um, in which he used symbols for his traits. So this was a great innovation at the time. He used capital letter for the dominant trait, big Y, for example, and the, the lowercase letter for the recessive character, little y, for example. So it's clear from this that he was thinking about factors or determinants responsible for the manifestation of the character rather than the substances themselves. So this is really, really crucial his characters weren't transmitted directly from generation to generation. Um, so Mendel understood that he was measuring the movement of information pertaining to the traits, not the substance of the traits themselves. So if big Y denotes the particle that determines yellow seeds um, and little a green, then the parents, big Y, little y, give rise to offspring, big Y, little y. Yellow, because this character is dominant. In Mendel's translated words, the expression, sorry, I'm not used to this, computer, um, hang on, I've got lost now. Oh. The expression of, um, in Mendel's translated words, the expression of um, big A plus two, big A, little a plus little a, i.e. the one to two to one ratio, showed the developmental series for the progeny of big A, little a hybrids. Now, of course, we'd say big A, big A, plus big A, little A, plus little A, little A. And that's what all the textbooks show when they talk about Mendel's work. But actually, Mendel couldn't possibly have known that the true breeding plants have a pair of, of factors. I've done this again. Oh. Mendel couldn't possibly have known that um, the... Uh, I've got lost. This is like the most trigger-happy thing ever. Uh, so Mendel couldn't possibly have known that the true breeding plants have a pair of factors. But of course, that doesn't matter at all for his logic. He went on to examine dihybrid crosses. So he crossed round yellow with wrinkled green. And he found all round yellow in the F1. And upon selfing those, he found the 93 to 3 to 1 ratio in F2. So further crossing then enabled him to establish whether these were constant or variable, and thus designate the correct symbols. So what Mendel found then was that there's a three-term developmental series um, for the progeny of hybrids with a single trait, big A plus big A little a plus little a. But for the dihybrid crosses, he needed a nine-term series to describe the progeny of the dihybrids. So big A, big B, big A, little b, little a, big B, little a, little b, constant for both traits. Two lots where there's variable for one but not for the other, follow the logic, and for 
um, big A, little A, big B, little B, variable for both. So twice as many members in each of the second categories, where you're variable for one, and four times as many in the third category, variable for both. So Mendel realized that the dihybrid developmental series is actually produced by multiplying two monohybrid developmental series together, one for each trait. And I think perhaps it was thanks to Mendel's enthusiastic study of physics that had introduced him to the discipline of some of the mathematical concepts that turned out to be so important in this interpretation. So like this combinatorial analysis that we've just been through. So, it's like going without me. Oh. I'm not actually controlling it. Right, there's a ghost. So, Mendel then went, went on with trihybrids, concluding that the progeny of trihybrids um, represents... Uh, represent the terms of a combination series in which the developmental series for each pair are combined, um, a result that is only possible in the light of this conclusion that he made. The behavior of each pair of differing characters in hybrid association is independent of other differences between the two original parental plants. So Mendel realized that if n represents the number of traits, then 3 to the n represents the number of classes in the combination series, and two to the n, the number of classes that remain constant. So there's a huge amount of variation possible, which he must have thought was amazing. And it was 50 years later, of course, that Fisher published his great work, The Correlation Between Relatives on the Supposition of Mendelian Inheritance. So what Fisher did, crucially in this paper, was to show, by elaborate mathematics, that continuous variation could be the result of the action of many discrete determinants. And so Mendelian genetics was, in fact, completely consistent with the idea of evolution driven by natural selection. But Mendel had seen that with his, with his crosses. So from all of this, then, Mendel realized that pollen and germ cells, the gametes, um, from a big A, little a hybrid, contained either big A or little a, never both, of course, that's not the representation that Mendel would have given them, but that's one that's familiar to us. And that germ cells carrying big A were as equally likely to be fertilized by pollen carrying big A or little a, with both types being produced in equal numbers. In other words, fertilization was random between germ cells and pollen cells, or egg cells and sperm cells for animals, regardless of what factors they carried. So this later became known as the law of equal segregation. That's the only possible way to get big A plus two big A little a plus little a, because four types of fertilization are possible. Big A with big A, big A with little a, little a with big A, and little a with little a. So this concept simply expands out when more characters are considered. So the implication here is that different traits are controlled by different elements, but the elements are all transmitted by an identical mechanism. Constancy at the mechanistic level begets huge variety at the level of the organism. As Mendel put it, the distinctive characters of two plants can ultimately rest only on differences in the nature and grouping of the elements that are present in their foundational cells in living interaction. I think this is an absolute forerunner of the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis that was later discovered by and confirmed by Beadle and Tatum. So Mendel's paper was first translated into English, was commit, commissioned by Bateson for the Royal Horticultural Society, so another really nice link to the RHS and a reason why we're here today. And it appeared in the Society's Journal in 1901, next to an advertisement for Carter's grass seeds as used at Lord's and the Oval and other leading county cricket grounds. We often talk about exceptions to Mendel's law as something that came later, that Mendel's laws were somehow oversimplistic, that he missed stuff. But this is also not really true. For example, Mendel certainly found exceptions to his rule of dominance. Mendel wrote, the experiments conducted with ornamental plants in past years already produced evidence that hybrids as a rule do not represent the precise intermediate form between the original parents. 
with individual characteristics that are particularly noticeable, like those related to the form and size of the leaves and to the pubescence of the individual parts, the intermediate form is, in fact, almost always apparent. In other cases, however, one of the two original parental characters possesses such an overwhelming dominance that it's difficult or quite impossible to find the other in the hybrid. So he absolutely saw semi-dominance and co-dominance. The biggest Mendelian controversy is the accusation that Mendel falsified data to more closely fit his hypothesis. So Weldon wrote to Pearson in 1901, after applying Pearson's newly developed chi-squared test to Mendel's data, that Mendel had cooked his figures, but that he was substantially right. Fisher famously said in a lecture in 1911 that it may just have been luck, or it may be that the worthy German abbot, in his ignorance of probable error, unconsciously placed doubtful plants on the side, which favoured his hypothesis. And later wrote in 1936, the data of most, if not all, of the experiments have been falsified so as to agree closely with Mendel's expectations. Although, to be fair, it's, it's thought that um, Fisher did presume that it was an assistant who had done this in his desire to please Mendel rather than Mendel himself. Fisher does definitely acknowledge that Mendel's paper represents experimental research is conclusive in their results, faultlessly lucid in presentation, and vital to the understanding, not of one problem of current interest, but of many. Many analyses of the so-called Mendel-Fisher controversy have been undertaken based on statistical, botanical, and historical considerations, and the, the jury is largely still out. But one of the most definitive accounts, Alan Franklin in 2008, concludes the experiments that had initially triggered Fisher's suspicions can be explained without any fraud. But the issue of the too-good-to-be-true aspect of Mendel's data found by Fisher still stands. So we don't know the answer to that. Mendel published his work in 1866, two years before Darwin published his pangenesis theory of blending inheritance based on his gemules made from all parts of the organism. And it seems extraordinary in these days of instant communication that Darwin never came into contact with this work. What would have happened if Darwin and Mendel had met and discussed Mendel's results? It's certainly true that Mendel was well acquainted with the ideas of biological evolution, from Unger, for example, long before he learned of Darwin. And he likely learned of Darwin in um, 1863, the final year of his P experiments, because in 1863 he obtained a German translation of Origin of Species, which he annotated extensively. And those annotations have been researched and published by Fairbanks and others. So the evidence suggests that Mendel was very interested in Darwin's writings and their relevance to his work, but that he didn't become an ardent promoter. Maybe he was thinking about trouble in the monastery and Pope Pius IX. On the other hand, there is no evidence that Darwin knew anything about Mendel. There's a story, largely myth mythological, about the uncut paper that Darwin had an uncut um, copy of, of, um, of Mendel's paper in his study, because in those days you had to physically cut the pages in order to read um, the paper. But that seems to be a myth, although it is true that Darwin did own a book that made reference to Mendel, but that the relevant pages in that book are uncut. So that's probably where that story comes from. So after 1866, then Mendel continued his work using many different species, some really complex and hard to interpret, and fell down various rabbit holes with them. But notably, experiments in Mattiola or stocks, shown here, and Zia and Mirabilis, they behaved exactly like, like the peas. Mendel became abbot in 1868 on the death of Knapp, but he continued his research for some time. And this was mostly revealed in letters to fellow scientist Carl von Nageli. But Mendel gradually gets sucked into more and more monastery administration, like tax affairs. It's odd that he only published his later work in this letter form. It's possible that he prepared papers that were burnt after his death in the general clear out. And there's even been speculation that he burned them himself because he was bitter about being attacked by the religious zealots or his monastery being under attack. 
It's also very revealing that despite being the recipient of extensive scientific correspondence from Mendel, Nagali failed to mention Mendel's work in his own magnum opus. Maybe he didn't get it, or maybe he didn't want to give credit to others. Mendel died in 1884 at the age of 62, young by today's standards. His paper remains a fine example of brilliant experimental design, data-led hypothesis testing, and the development of, theory of a theory of heredity that's essentially unchanged today. That this work was completely ignored for three decades makes it all the more remarkable. So what are the modern-day exceptions to Mendel's law? Well, linkage is a pretty important one. Mendel's work and the discipline of his crosses paved the way for Morgan to find this in his fruit fly crosses. It's bizarre that Thomas Hunt Morgan, shown here, was born in Kentucky in 1866, the same year that Mendel published his work. So Morgan's particular genius was to spot inconsistencies in Mendel's second law, the law of independent assortment. And these exceptions occur when hereditary, when hereditary factors are segregated together. And he came up with the concept of linkage and the chromosome theory to explain them. But then even more than that, Morgan spotted inconsistencies in his own inconsistencies and came up with the idea of recombination, which led to mapping. Bateson in particular found the chromosome theory to be really tricky to accept, finding the idea that particles of chromatin or of any substance, however complex, could influence ratios and transmission patterns inconceivable. He preferred the reduplication view of linkage, based on the idea that factors didn't necessarily segregate simultaneously during cell division. But it was Becky Saunders, Bateson's lifelong collaborator and co-founder of the Genetic Society, who embraced the idea of Morgan and the cell biologists who could actually see reductional division during gamete formation. And she gave it much airtime during her 1920 presidential address at the British Association for the Advancement of Science, now the British Science Association. She said, it must then be acknowledged that Morgan's interpretation of the cytological evidence has much in its favour. The striking parallel between the behaviour of the chromosomes and the distributional relations of Mendelian allelomorphs is obvious. The existence in Drosophila of four pairs of chromosomes and of four sets of linked characters can hardly be more coincidence, can hardly be mere coincidence. So it was Saunders who persuaded Bateson of the utter genius of this work. And two years later in 1922, Morgan and his student Sturtevant were invited and celebrated at the 11th meeting of the Genetical Society. Other exceptions to Mendel's laws include cytoplasmic inheritance of organelle genomes, sex chromosome evolution, gene conversion, meiotic drives, epigenetics. Exceptions to any rule drive discovery in science. Um, and this must be behind the title of Bateson's biography by Koch and Fors Forsdyke, Treasure Your Exceptions. Mendel's laws are simply a manifestation, after all, of the mechanism of gamete formation through meiosis and the inheritance of unlinked allelic variants present on chromosomes. So anything that doesn't do that is going to present exceptions. The exceptions give us a richer and deeper understanding of genetic mechanisms. They work with the rules rather than proving the rule, as the cliche goes. Whoops, that's one little trick you have to again. No. The most revealing exceptions are the big ones, the ones that challenge the underlying log logic, like meiotic drives, breaking the law of equal segregation, introducing the chance for alleles to gain the system for their own ends. So modifying inheritance itself. And epigenetic phenomena, modifying the relationship between genotype and phenotype, like in genomic imprinting. Although it's true to say that, for the most part, and leaving imprinting aside, fancy epigenetic modifications of DNA sequence are simply rubbed out during gamete formation, thus preserving the sanctity of inheritance. Of course, the exceptions to this are really fascinating and could take us right back to Darwin's pangenesis. Whatever, wherever this next take, takes us, it's clear that none of this would have been possible without Mendel. And not just this, of course, our understanding of heredity. The application of Mendel's genetic methodology to mutants has blown apart much of biology and revealed a myriad of molecular mechanisms from cell division to organismal behaviour. Mendel took very much the modern empirical approach to science, 
rather than the philosophical, logical approach taken so successfully by Darwin. Mendel's work was certainly not descriptive in the often negative, somewhat dismissive parlance loved by model, modern journal editors. Who, out of all the scientists involved in work on evolution and heredity, was unique? I would argue that it was Mendel. Several scientists were homing in on natural selection at the time of Darwin's publication. Wallace, for one. Unger, I would argue. What about the structure of DNA? Several scientists were converging on this, for certain, but Mendel's work was utterly unique and required new imaginings, like Newton and Einstein and Morgan, perhaps. What gifts Mendel bestowed upon, human upon humanity and what a privilege it is to be a geneticist. Thank you. And I'd just like to um, acknowledge the Genetic Society for putting on this great celebration in this wonderful place, and to also include um, another picture of Jonathan, together with Wendy Bickmore wearing her pea dress um, at, at Chelsea. So, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so absolutely. And I think we're, we're finding a lot of them. Um, and exceptions are always fascinating. So yes, absolutely. And I think they'll continue to be so. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know is the, is, is the answer. I haven't, I haven't looked extensively at that. I, I think it's a really important area. I'm, I'm sure it's been written about. Um, and it's, it's definitely something that would be really useful to ask Daniel Fairbanks, who looked a lot at the relationships between Darwin and Mendel. I think it's a really interesting question. Yeah, I, it, it, there's, it, there's nothing really written about that. He talks a lot about constancy, but I think he was really thinking about plants. And of course, it was when Mendel's laws were rediscovered, Mendel's work was rediscovered at the beginning of the 20th century, that, it was, that Bates was one of the first to apply them to animals by looking at um, chickens and poultry and that kind of thing, and finding that they, they had this, I think it was the three different numbers of toes or something that... But, so they were some of the earliest experiments applied, applying those to animals. But I, yeah, I don't know whether Mendel was just so worried about what the religious nutters were going to say. Um, and he had to be really careful about what he said. I, I don't know. Or whether he just thought somehow it was different. Or I don't know. I don't know. Interesting question. So... Um, genetic society uh, really values and celebrates emerging talent. Um, and um, the Sir Kenneth Mather Memorial Prize uh, is awarded to either a, a BSc or master's student of any uh, UK uh, institution uh, who has shown outstanding performance in an area of quantitative or population genetics. Uh, Kenneth Mather was an honorary professor of genetics at Birmingham, uh, a fellow of the Royal Society and a past president of the Genetics Society. And building variously on the work of Galton, Pearson, Fisher, Haldane, uh, that Mendelian genetics did not provide the answers to continuous variation and evolution. 
uh, uh, Kenneth was passionate about uh, biometrical uh, genetics. It's very fitting that we uh, invite uh, today to give the uh, Mather uh, Memorial Lecture uh, um, um, at Rosa Cheeseman, who um, was awarded this uh, uh, prize in 2019-2020 uh, and has recently uh, completed a really remarkable uh, thesis at uh, King's College London entitled Leveraging Family Data for Complex Trait Genomics. She's now uh, conducting postdoctoral work in Norway, uh, continuing uh, her work on complex, complex, complex trait uh, uh, analysis. Uh, and I think that's what she's going to talk to us about today. Many, many congratulations, Rosa. Uh, it's wonderful to see all your family here with you today. Uh, and it's great to spend time with them too. So um, uh, it's really a, a pleasure, actually and an honor, an honor to have you here today to talk about why we need families from Mendel to sociogenomics. The small topic. Of <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. I'm very, very excited and honored to be part of uh, today's event. So uh, I work in the field of social science genetics, which is the combination of human social sciences, uh, specifically psychology and sociology, and genetics. And I would like today to tell you the story of genetic research on education. And uh, this story really comes in three main chapters, starting with the, the backbone of this research in twin and family data. And then uh, from the early 2000s, we had a new wave of really exciting research based on unrelated individuals and based on DNA data. So this is the genomic era. And then uh, much more recently, uh, I think we're moving into a new era where family data is coming back to the fore in genetic research on education. Uh, and I would like to argue today that family data is essential we're going to make progress in research on the genetics of education. And I think that such research could potentially have very interesting uh, policy implications for the design of uh, better school systems. So uh, I have to uh, immediately admit that I'm a bit biased in arguing for the importance of twin and family data because my genetically identical twin, who's sitting there, and I have been part of a twin study since we were born. Um, and we've been contributing data since uh, 1994 when the study began. So the, the TED study, the Twins Early Development Study, is a study of over 10,000 identical and non-identical twins born in England and Wales. And uh, they've been tracked uh, throughout their development. And it, the study was originally all about cognitive development, but it also has a huge wealth of information about personality, mental and physical health. And the study has been uh, yielding a huge base of evidence on the nature and nurture of all of these traits over time. And uh, in combination with many, many other twin cohorts, TEDS has contributed to this uh, knowledge of uh, the nature and nurture of complex human traits. And so this uh, figure here summarizes results from uh, studies of over a million twin twins and uh, for thousands of complex human traits. So you can see that uh, the studies have focused on comparisons of identical and non-identical twins. So identical twins are the ones shown in red here, MZ monozygotic twins. Non-identical twins are the dizygotic type. So um, overall, the identical twins show much stronger correlations for their traits than non-identical twins. So uh, this is such a nice, neat, simple way of showing that genes are important for human differences. Uh, because these types of twins are uh, the same in that they grow up in the family environment together and they're born at the same time. So the excess similarity of identical twins reflects the importance of genetic influences. And for educational attainment, which uh, is a concept referring to how far you go in, in, in your edu education, is it a few years, is it uh, beyond PhD level? Uh, for educational attainment, 
the, uh, the proportion of variation in the population that's due to genetic differences or the heritability, twin studies have shown is between 40 to 60 percent. So uh, twin studies and extended twin family studies have not only been limited to this simple partitioning of nature versus nurture, but they've revealed so many sophisticated insights about how nature and nurture uh, correlate and interact. And uh, I love this study that came out of Norway in the 1980s that compared the heritability of education across cohorts for men and for women. And this study showed that the heritability of educational attainment in women increased rapidly over time as women uh, were more able to access education. Uh, and this increase in heritability was stronger for women than men. So this makes the really important point that genetic influences on education are dependent upon the context uh, that humans are living in, the social uh, milieu, and that their uh, genetic influences are not deterministic as they depend on environment. And uh, also, interestingly, uh, this study led to the idea that stronger genetic influences might be reflective of a more open and equal society. But despite this uh, knowledge that uh, genetic influences on education interact with the environment, it's very important to note that uh, specifically research on the genetics of cognitive and education-related traits have been uh, severely misused and uh, misrepresented. And we've got a very dark history of, of eugenics um, that has been uh, immorally and incorrectly fueled by uh, pedigree-based uh, studies and Mendel's laws. But um, as, we've, as we've already heard, uh, Mendel's laws are very important, but uh, for complex traits like education, it's not in the way that we learn about in school with these single gene traits such as uh, pea colour. Uh, in contrast, for complex traits like education, the concept of polygenicity is key. So this uh, goes back to what Fisher discovered, which was that although uh, Mendel's laws do hold in that we have these discrete units of inheritance that, uh, you know, we have random segregation in the parents to create the offspring genetic variation. For complex traits, uh, we don't have a single gene that's responsible for this, but uh, potentially thousands or more um, of genetic variants that have individually small effects, but uh, overall accumulate to, uh, to create a probabilistic genetic basis of, uh, of education. Uh, and this uh, figure is from a, a paper that nicely summarizes um, the finding that even if we only have uh, three genetic variants, uh, you can uh, see that there's a, a normal distribution that's starting to be built up of genetic liability to a complex trait. So uh, that was the background on twin and family studies and the relevance of Mendel um, and the polygenic basis of educational attainment. But uh, when we were able to uh, measure the human genome, we started to be able to ask, uh, can we find uh, individual locations on the genome that confer probability of uh, going far in your education? So this marked the new wave of uh, genomic research on education or socio-genomics. And when I started my PhD, this was um, a landmark study that came out that everyone was really excited about because uh, researchers from the Social Science Genetics Consortium managed to gather a huge sample of over a million individuals for whom we had information on their genetic uh, variation that was actually measured by DNA and their educational attainment, which is uh, often available in survey data, so they were able to access a huge amount of, uh, of data. And uh, what these researchers showed was that there's uh, a very large number of genetic variants that are associated with educational attainment. So here you can see every red dot is a genetic variant, and along the x-axis is the position of the variant on the human genome. And on the y-axis, you see the, the significance of the association between that variant and education attainment. So uh, we have 
significant associations that are above this dashed line of, uh, of uh, significance spread across the genome. And uh, again, this really reinforces this polygenic model of complex traits. Uh, and importantly, uh, this, uh, this study was conducted without relying on any kind of relatedness structure. So that's part of the reason why they were able to build up such a huge sample, because uh, now that we could measure DNA differences between people, we didn't need to search for specific relatives like twins and the children of twins and adoptees. Um, so uh, another uh, amazing innovation that came out of this genomic era was the ability to infer something about individuals' uh, genetic chance of going far in education. And this is called polygenic scoring. And more recently, uh, a, the term polygenic index has been proposed. And I think that's a, a much better uh, term because it has uh, less kind of uh, value uh, assumptions behind it. You know, if you're talking about an individual's polygenic score for education, it can sound as if uh, that's, um, they're better in some way, but that's, uh, what it really means is that they've got uh, a larger number of genetic variants that are, uh, that happen to give them an advantage in the education society that we're in at the moment. But I'm going to use the term polygenic score because that's what the uh, what the labels are in the studies that I'm um, showing that have already been conducted. So briefly, polygenic scores, uh, these are individual markers of uh, genetic propensity towards a trait that are uh, based on these genome association studies like the one I uh, just presented in the previous slide. So what you do is you access the, the results of such a study where you have every uh, genetic variant, which is probably millions, and you, uh, you know the association between each variant and educational attainment. And then in a separate uh, sample, for example, this could be um, the study that my twin and I are part of, you, you, you know uh, every individual's uh, genetic variation and you can basically, as, as with a, a kind of psychological questionnaire, you count up how many uh, education-associated variants uh, this person has across their genome, and then you simply weight that information by the strength of the association between each variant and educational attainment. And what you end up with in your, in your sample is a nice normal distribution that captures uh, people's um, genetic load or, or uh, genetic uh, index for educational attainment. And uh, this is an example of data I was able to access from the Twins Early Development Study, which we're part of. This is to show the nice normal curve and, uh, the, of uh, polygenic uh, scores for body mass index and anxiety in this study that we're part of. So because we have uh, identical uh, DNA, my twin and I ha have the same polygenic score for BMI, which is uh, uh, around two stam standard deviations above the mean. BMI, but about three standard deviations below the mean for anxiety. Um, so that's what these variables look like. You have a single number that summarizes every individual's uh, genetic score. Uh, and uh, polygenic scores for educational attainment have been uh, used now uh, a lot for uh, very interesting questions that couldn't really be addressed uh, previously and that have, for example, informed us about the mechanisms by which genes uh, lead uh, in the future towards uh, higher educational achievement and attainment. So, for example, uh, you can do association studies that search for um, what's correlated with higher educational attainment uh, polygenic scores, and studies have shown that it's not just uh, things like cognitive uh, test performance when you're a child, but also open personality and uh, other kind of non-cognitive characteristics. So we're understanding more about the mechanisms uh, that lead to differences between us in education through the use of polygenic scores. And another uh, aim is to just predict differences between people in their education using uh, genetic and environmental information. And this figure here, uh, 
if you look at the, the blue uh, bar, that shows that um, in this particular study, 16% of the variation in uh, school performance was due to polygenic scores. And this really rivals uh, classic sociological measures that predict uh, differences between children in their, in their performance, such as family income. So they're starting to be quite powerful variables. And all of these insights, which really came from studies of unrelated people, led people to have to write articles with titles like this to justify why are we still publishing twin studies that are based on very specific samples uh, when we can directly measure genetics and uh, use cool tools like polygenic scores. But when we're doing our genomic research on education using only unrelated individuals, I want to argue that a key issue with that is that we can't adequately understand the nature of interplay between genetics and the environment. So, uh, for example, take an association between a child's polygenic score for educational attainment and their educational outcome. That's child gene type is, uh, uh, here refers to the polygenic score. So most of the time, for whatever uh, research question we have, uh, for the majority of our research, it's important that polygenic scores for education reflect that individual's actual genetic variation that is uh, in some way leading to their educational outcome th through that person's own uh, being. But any variant that's present in the child is also present in at least one of their parents. And we know that genetic variation in the parents uh, is likely to play a role in how they shape the family environment they provide for the children. For example, uh, it's heritable how many books the parents will buy for the child, how, how much do they read to their child. In turn, these uh, genetically influenced parental environments can shape the child's education. So uh, wh when we only have data on unrelated uh, children, and we're not modeling the parents' genotypes, we have no way to distinguish is this polygenic score effect coming from the individual child themselves, or is it capturing the family environment that's indexed by the parents' genes? And this concept really came to the fore in this GWAS uh, context uh, with the publication of this paper in 2018 where they uh, amazingly showed that the polygenic scores for educational attainment based on uh, DNA differences between parents that were not transmitted to the child still are associated with the child's education. And because these uh, polygenic scores are uh, capturing non-transmitted genetic material, they can only affect the child through the environment. Uh, so this concept was labelled genetic nurture, and it started to make uh, genomics researchers concerned about how to interpret uh, results from polygenic score studies. Uh, but it's important to note that we uh, already knew something about th these concepts from twin and family studies. So researchers who for a long time had been studying the genetics of parenting and the genetics of psychological differences uh, uh, as well as people um, doing research on animal breeding, uh, there were many people who already had uh, concepts and theories and data around this. Uh, for example, concepts of gene-environment correlation, parental indirect genetic effects. So genetic nurture, I won't go into it in detail now how these concepts overlap and differ, but uh, there's substantial knowledge that uh, was realized could uh, be very useful to feed back in in this new DNA era. So that brings me to this third phase uh, of genetic research on education, and uh, I'm excited to share some of my own research uh, on this area. So uh, two of my studies, one was from uh, my PhD work uh, on trying to uh, use family data to really understand where the predictive power of polygenic scores comes from. 
And the second one is more of a social science study that's using genetic uh, data to understand how schools work. So first of all, I've already introduced this concept that a child's polygenic score might not only be associated with their education because of a so-called uh, direct individual-based genetic effect, but also because it's tagging information about the family environment. And uh, we noticed an opportunity here to use a classic uh, uh, study design from the era of twin and family studies, which is the adoption design. So when uh, an individual is adopted by parents who they're not genetically related to, this uh, breaks the link between uh, the genetics in the offspring and parent generation. So uh, we realized that uh, uh, if you have the polygenic score for education of an individual who's been adopted, their polygenic score effect on their own education is a, a closer reflection of these within individual mechanisms uh, and uh, avoids this uh, confounding with the family environment. So luckily, we had access to this amazing study of uh, half a million UK adults, the UK Biobank, and even though this wasn't designed to be a family study, just because they sampled so many people, they happened to include over 6,000 uh, adoptees. And uh, uh, to our knowledge, nobody had yet used this adoption information in combination with polygenic scores. So what we did was uh, quite simply to look at the association between polygenic scores for education and educational attainment in people who were adopted versus people who were not adopted. And we saw that uh, among non-adopted individuals who were reared by their uh, genetic relatives, polygenic scores explained 7.5% uh, of the variability between those people in how far they went in education. And uh, polygenic scores now explain probably double that because the studies have become bigger, but this is in line with uh, what people were finding at the time. When we repeated this analysis in adoptees, the power of the polygenic score prediction shrank by half. So this uh, is quite strong evidence that the polygenic scores for education are not just capturing uh, genetic uh, propensity to uh, educational attainment, but they are really uh, measures of environmental circumstances, and this uh, really detracts from any use of polygenic scores for education for asking causal questions, because uh, change in the, in the child's polygenic score will not necessarily result in a change in their outcome, uh, because the parents uh, genotype is also very important. So this really speaks to the importance of the environment uh, as well as genetic differences uh, in educational attainment. So this adoption design is a well-known classic way of dis disentangling nature and nurture and it's uh, like as close as we can get to, uh, to an experimental design in humans. But actually uh, nature provides us with an even neater study design uh, which is akin to a randomized control trial. So we, uh, as we've already heard, uh, Mendel's laws tell us that when you know the genetic variation in the parents, the offspring genetic variation is a random subset of that. And more recently this has been termed uh, the outcome of a genetic lottery. So uh, once you have information about the uh, genetic variation going on within a family, you can take advantage of the within-family genetic differences as being as good as random uh, variation that is now much more useful for a causal research design. So uh, now uh, I want to present some research that I've done since I moved to Norway for my postdoc. Uh, investigating how the school works um, and for whom does it matter the most. So
So uh, sociologists are very concerned with the education system and understanding what's the impact of schools on children's educational performance. And uh, in Norway in particular, there's so much effort that goes towards equalising the school environment for everyone. There's very, very few private schools. There's major redistributive policies to make sure that schools are the same wherever you go and it doesn't make a difference to your outcomes, what school you go to. So sociologists in Norway tend to find very small effects of school on uh, differences between children. But uh, it hasn't really received much attention. Is this the case for all children? Do schools really uh, make no difference, like whoever you are, whatever characteristics you bring into the school? And uh, I really think that this hasn't been touched by sociologists because it's so difficult to do research on this question. And uh, for example, if you want to understand, uh, does school play a bigger role for children who have uh, poor prior achievement? You don't really know what's going on because the, uh, the child's prior achievement uh, could have been caused by the school and also the, the child's achievement can shape which school they go to. So this is a key problem that children are not uh, randomly spread across different schools. So it's very hard to study interplay between children and schools. So the key thing here is that Mendelian segregation and polygenic scores within families provide a really neat tool to study social science research on schools because once you know the child's genetic variation conditional on their parents' genetic variation, that's random DNA differences that are not, that, that are not caused by the school and are very unlikely to be um, shaping the children's selection into school. So uh, in Norway, we have this amazing study called MOBA, which is the Norwegian Mother, Father and Child Cohort Study. And uh, this, the study that I'm going to present uh, was based on over 23,000 children, mother, father trios uh, with DNA data on, uh, on education polygenic scores and on their national test uh, performance at uh, a range of different ages. Um, so what we wanted to do was to ask for whom does school matter the most? And uh, as you can see on the y-axis, we have um, the total effect of school on academic achievement in childhood, uh, where uh, 0 0.05 uh, reflects uh, uh, that schools explain 5% of the differences between children in their school performance. And then importantly, on the x-axis, you see differences between children in their uh, in their educational polygenic score, where the polygenic score is um, adjusted for the parent's polygenic score, so it really uh, reflects random variation and it can't reflect these parental environmental mechanisms. And what we saw was that there were differences in the impact of school depending on the child's uh, genotype. So these classic sociological uh, studies that I earlier mentioned, they would be focusing on the average child. So uh, if you look at the zero value in the middle of the, of the plot, you can see that the impact of school is small. The uh, differences between schools are, uh, are quite small and only contribute to about two to three percent of the differences between children in their achievement. But then when you, uh, when you move down the distribution of the polygenic index for education, the impact of school increases. And uh, it may, may sound like a small number, but, uh, but 5 to 6% of the variation being explained by school is uh, quite a lot in policy terms. And this is something, uh, this it starts to become a number that the Norwegian education system might want to address because uh, if you're focusing on um, comparing children who are all, uh, a group of children who are all two standard deviations below the mean polygenic score for education, they're the same in, term, in genetic terms. Uh, this shows that schools are creating variation between them in how well they do. So this is, uh, this is 
social inequality happening. And um, the next steps that I'm most excited about are to try to get some more data about what these schools are like and try to understand what is going on in these schools where children in the lower end of the distribution of polygenic scores still do well. Can we figure out using these genetic tools how we can best uh, construct our school environments to support everyone? Yeah, I'm, I'm almost at the end. I will try to think about it. Yeah. Uh, so, to summarise the talk, uh, we began with this uh, long-standing base of evidence from twins and families that have told us that genes play a role in educational differences between us. And then we have a new DNA-based era that is... Uh, finding specific DNA variants that are associated with education. And these exciting, massive studies have started to lead, lead people to question uh, the value of twin studies. But now uh, we're seeing uh, not just my research, but there's a, a lot of other uh, scholars who are doing research that's now reincorporating family data. And uh, I've tried to show that family-based genetic research on education is important uh, not only to be able to evaluate what our genetic tools, such as polygenic scores, really mean. Where, where is this prediction really coming from? Is it uh, within individual genetic effect? But also, uh, in the context of sociological research on education, uh, within family genetic research, really has a role to play in generating new insights that are potentially relevant to designing more equitable school environments. So uh, why do we need families in, in genetic research? Uh, we need them to get much more accurate uh, and robust and contextual findings. And in the future, families should be uh, the unit of analysis in genetic research on education. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. That was, that was really great. great. Questions for Rosa. Davor had a technical question about the... I will get myself technical question. I saw that it's normal that during the presentation if something becomes really unclear that you can... Interrupt. Yeah, I mean, that depends on how informal... When we're informal here, and this is, this is, this is fine, but why don't you pick it up during the, during the break, actually? Um, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure Rosa would be happy to explain... Uh, ordinary children and adopted children. What did you exactly find with these two columns? What did they mean? Um, so what, what this means is that we've calculated polygenic scores for educational attainment in the UK Biobank, so in 500,000 people, and then we've separated out people who were adopted and we've uh, just done the same analysis in a people who are adopted and people who are not. And uh, it shows that uh, among people who are adopted, their, their genes, their polygenic score matters less for their educational attainment. And I don't know whether everybody in the audience made it quite clear. We are, what does polygenic score mean? Uh, yeah, well, I'm happy to explain this again. Uh, so uh, I, I like to explain polygenic score as being very similar to a psychological questionnaire. Say you're asked, um, what's your personality like? And there are many individual questions that each reflect an aspect of your personality and they all um, add up to give an overall score that measures your conscientiousness, for example. So with a polygenic score, it's, 
is very similar because you have many, many DNA variations that contribute to variability in uh, uh, genetic variability in a trait. And what you're doing is just um, adding up the number of trait increasing alleles that a person has. And you can then, uh, you can then weight that score using information from uh, a big genome-wide association study. And it's, so it's like a weighted sum score that uh, gives information about an individual's um, uh, genetic liability to a trait. So let's pick up on that later, Davor, because time is tight. Uh, question over here. That was really, really cool. Um, what insight do you have as to um, sibling rivalry on the... Um sibling rivalry on the... Uh, on the yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, sibling, uh, sibling interactions are quite an important uh, avenue for future research with polygenic schools because they would... Uh, because we're basically assuming with all this, uh, with our models, that those those don't exist. But um, especially, you know, with these within family studies, because within fa uh, within sibling pair differences are also a really um, increasingly common uh, method for for doing this kind of family social genetics research. But if the siblings' genes are influencing each other. Um, then uh, we can't interpret those sibling genetic differences as being the cause of their um, outcome differences. So uh, I think there's some research showing that for education, there's, uh, there's some birth order effects uh, and genetic, uh, indirect genetic effects coming from siblings to affect the other one's education. I'm not too sure about rivalry per se, but uh, maybe I'll steal that idea and study and that. And there is an emerging literature in mice on, on uh, social behavioural interactions uh, in cages and strains and things like that. So, uh, Robin. Um, nice talk. Um, on the adoption story, of course, when you have a child who's adopted, they will have spent the maybe the first few years of their life with, in different family settings, sometimes not a very nice, friendly family setting, um, all sorts of problems. Um, obviously, maybe not yet, but you, you would be able to get data for children born from embryo donation, where, of course, their environment's been, you know, within the mother and uh, stable within their family. Uh, so that might be another interesting way of looking at that. Yeah, that's a great suggestion, and I, uh, I think that would be... Uh, I, think, I think there are about 500 children born each year in the UK through embryo donation. Yeah, that's a really exciting uh, idea. I totally agree. It would be uh, important, I think, to compare results across different uh, designs like this, and then you can see whether the adoption one is really uh, biased because children are actually growing up with their relatives for a bit, and then they're taken away and so on. Yeah. You mentioned that you uh, did your study in Norway where education tries to level everything out. Have you got any hint about what would happen if you did it in Britain or the States where the educational system is is perhaps having a bigger effect? Uh, I haven't looked at that, but I would expect... I was quite uh, surprised, actually, to see any differences between schools uh, uh, at all in Norway, and I think they would probably be much larger in the UK. Um, although I think the school effects literature is already a bit mixed, um, so, but I would love to do a cross-national comparison. Very quickly. Um, it was interesting that your curve didn't go up on the right hand side. Yeah. So people aiming for high achievement shouldn't bother to fuss with the education. Don't worry about which school you're going to. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Christina, one question from the chat. Um, Mick is asking could in depth reading of a single but clever book uh, be an alternative to many books bought for a child? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Um, could in-depth reading of a single but clever book be an alternative to many books bought for a child? So I think that... Is environmental that nuance, I think. Many, many... Uh, yeah, that's totally outside of my <laughs> uh, area. I would love to know more about that, but I can't claim to be an expert on reading, uh, reading learning. Yeah. 
Thanks, Ro <laughs> thanks, Rosa. I think we I think we need to move on. That was a great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, the Balfour Lecture uh, is named after the Genetic Society's first president, uh, the Earl of Balfour, who took office in uh, 1919. It's an award to um, mark the contributions to genetics of an outstanding young investigator. Uh, and the recipient of the award must, have norm must normally uh, have less than 10 years postdoctoral research experience um, at the time of nomination. Uh, Dr. Sam uh, Bajati is the Balfour Lecturer for 2022. Uh, Sam is a group leader at the Wellcome uh, Sanger Institute, where he's been since 2018. And he's also an honorary consultant pediatric oncologist in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Cambridge. Um, Sam, in the bar last night, told me not to say very much, so I'm going to be, say two sentences. Sam's research focuses on the origins of childhood cancer. Uh, and uh, uses state-of-the-art technologies, uh, for example, to, to explore somatic mutations as barcodes of human development, which enable the reconstruction of the embryology of tissues. His work has also involved uh, single-cell analysis of human embryonic and extraembryonic tissues with a view to understanding uh, the cellular and developmental uh, basis uh, of and clonal origins of cancer. Uh, Sam's going to present his Balfour lecture uh, on reconstructing human development from somatic mutations. And I have an envelope for you afterwards. Don't go away without it. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for this very kind introduction. I think you get three sentences. find it. Oh, that box, okay. Into the desktop. That says Sam, okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much. So I would like to start by thanking the Genetic Society for inviting me to deliver this lecture this year. So it's an extraordinary privilege for me as a non-geneticist to be talking to you about the human genome and mutations in this beautiful place on this important day. So I'm a group leader at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. I'm also a Wellcome Senior Research Fellow and work one day a week as a pediatric oncologist at Addenbrooke's. I look after children with cancer outside the brain, and my research focuses on studying the origins of childhood cancer. So childhood cancer is a developmental disease. It arises from aberrations of embryonic and fetal life. So the way I sometimes think about myself is that I'm an onco oncological embryologist who uses nucleic acid readouts to make sense of that black box of human development and cancer formation. I will lay out some of the principles of my inquiry to you and share some of the key observations we have made. My background lies in cancer genomics. As a PhD student from 2011 to 2014, I spent most of my time studying the genetic basis of human bone and soft tissue tumors. I was supervised by Mike Stratton and Peter Campbell. And about halfway through my PhD, Mike suggested to explore an idea namely to see whether we can use somatic mutations to reconstruct embryology. And the idea is this, as cells divide, they accumulate somatic mutations due to minor infidelities of DNA, re DNA replication. Based on estimates from, a, from several different lines of evidence, we believe that that number in a human cell is about one substitution per cell division during early embryo, uh, embryo de uh, development. So therefore, the catalog of somatic mutations of a cell encodes its developmental past, and it should be feasible in principle to reconstruct the phylogeny of different cells from somatic mutations. That's what I'm illustrating here. So this is a full cellular organism. 
if we were able to read the genomes of the, deriv of the full derivative cells of this organism, we would be able to find uh, the mutations that these cells accumulated on their way to forming the full cellular organism. We would be able to deduce there was a red and a blue lineage and the private mutations of each of the cells. The idea itself to reconstruct development from mutations had been around for some time, but the challenge lay in, ex in, in its execution, specifically how do we find embryonic mutations, the needles in a haystack of three billion bases? What would be required to find these needles is a high fidelity readout of single cell genomes at base pair resolution, the holy grail of sequencing that no one has mastered to date. Others had tried to execute the idea by high throughput microsatellite PCR genotyping. That's attractive in all sorts of ways, but the core problem with this approach of genotyping single cell microsatellites is simply the error rate of mutation calling, but also the fact that the mutations at repeat tracks are of course not fixed during cell divisions. So together these sources of errors introduce noise into the data and thus fundamentally preclude a precise and exact reconstruction of the phylogenetic relationships of early embryogenesis. We pursued a different approach. We first of all focused on substitutions, which are almost always fixed mutations, except for when they're lost through deletions, which however we can look for, because when a mutant allele is lost in a heterozygous individual, there would be loss of heterozygosity in the mutant locus. Second, to overcome the invariable problem of introducing art artifacts by biochemical amplification of single cell DNA, we used the cellular machinery to amplify single cell DNA and cloned the cells through organoid cultures. This is what we did in collaboration with Hans Glavers from the Hubrecht Institute in the Netherlands. And although in vitro culture introduces its own mutations, these are private to each cell and thus do not distort the historical pre-existing mutational barcode of early cell development. We applied this framework to studying the development of two geriatric mice from which the Clavers team generated multiple single cell derived organoids. We called somatic mutations in each single cell organoid culture and defined as mosaic zones that were shared between at least two tissues and validated this by capillary sequencing. So here I'm showing you the example of a mutation in one of the mice. In this particular mouse, we grew 11 single cell organoid cultures from three different organs of the GI tract. The mutation that I'm showing here is mutation 13, highlighted in yellow. And in the next-gen sequencing data, which are those yellow and blue lines, you can beautifully see this mutation as a, a, a red sort of block through the middle. And that mutation was present in four cells, and it was absent from the others, which is also something we validated then by Sanger sequencing. So with this mutation catalog, we then reconstructed the phylogeny of each of the mouse. And this is the sort of tree that we got from this. So what you see here are mouse one and mouse two. The numbers are the various mutations, the embryonic mutations that we defined. And it's not a huge number if you look at this. For example, in mouse number one, we found a, 20, a total of 20 embryonic mutations. And then from the combinations of the mutations in the different organoid cultures, we were able to reconstruct the early phylogeny. And then in order to see whether we have actually, what cell division we have captured, are we sort of somewhere down the line in the, in the post-zygotic embryo or very early on, we measured the contribution of these mutations to the tail, the tail representing the whole mouse. And this is illustrated here. So for example, the mutations of the first cell division of mouse one, which give rise to cell B and C, if we add those varying allele frequencies together, we can explain 100% of the tail, and therefore that will be consistent with these cells representing the first cell division. And note here, apart from the fact that our uh, experiment served as a proof of principle, we made a very interesting observation, namely that the derivatives of the first cell division seem to contribute to the adult mouse unequally. And we saw that both in mouse one and number two. That was a really interesting finding and seemed to corroborate data from 
an experiment that, Ma that uh, Magdalena Zenitska Gertz had published many years prior to our, our observation. Markla had done a prospective in vitro labeling experiments of, uh, of the uh, cells of the first cell division, and what she could show in an experiment with hundreds of replicates is that one cell mainly makes the adult mouse and the other makes the extra embryonic membranes. Now, at this point, in 2004, we published our paper. I handed in my PhD and left research for a period of clinical training. The principle that we laid out in mice was then adopted and extended by others to study human development in a variety of settings, including some, I've listed some of the papers here which I found most exciting. It's, it's a pan-body study of, uh, of embryology through a, a slightly different approach using laser capture micro uh, dissection of groups of cells rather than single cell cloning. This, uh, the middle paper by Peter Campbell, which, which very much focused on human he hematopoiesis, and the, uh, the bottom paper that came out only, only very recently by Joseph Gleason from San Diego, who studied uh, neocortical development in humans with this approach. In 2016, I returned to Sangha as a Welcome Intermediate Research Fellow and began to develop my own science. It was at the time when the Human Cell Atlas project was launched, accompanied by the rise of high-throughput single-cell mRNA sequencing technologies. I seized that opportunity to begin to uh, develop my own science and inquiries into the origin of childhood cancer. And the question that we wanted to ask through these Human Cell atlas type approaches is, what is the childhood cancer cell in fetal developmental terms? And the experimental approach that we devised was it was and is extremely simple. We perform single cell mRNA sequencing on tumor cells. We perform single cell mRNA sequencing on relevant human fetal cells, and then compare the two to learn in what way the cancer cells are similar, but then more importantly, in what way do they differ, and does that help us learn about how cancers evolve, and also perhaps how we, how we might be able to target them. We applied this uh, experiment first in Wilms tumor, which we then published in 2018. As part of that experiment, we, we obtained chunks of tissues from kidneys from various places within the kidney, and that allowed us to do whole genome sequencing of normal kidney tissues and tumors to look for the phylogenetic relationship between these. So this is an example here. This is, could uh, call this our index case, a kidney of a nine-month-old child who had a tumor at the lower pole of a kidney. We took a biopsy from the tumor. We took a, uh, two biopsies from the other pole, the upper pole, cortex and medulla, and a piece of pelvis. And the pelvis is really quite important here because it is embryologically derived from a different lineage than the kidney parenchyma, cortex and medulla. Then we looked for mutations that were shared between this, and this is the sort of thing that we found. So what I'm showing you here is next generation sequencing raw data. Uh, blue and pink are reads going in one and the other direction. We're looking at a particular mutant locus, which is highlighted in light blue, and what you can see here is this. In G, which is a blood sample sequenced to about 100x, there is no mutant read. In D, which is a pelvis and embryologically different from the cortex and the medulla, we found no mutant read. In the tumor on the far right in red, you can see a clear mutation, and this is now the bit that is extraordinary, that in cortex and medulla of this child, in pieces of kidney obtained from the other end of the kidney, we find evidence of these mutations. And these are not just there with one or two reads, which could be contamination, and they are there at a very high frequency. And of course, we could also look at the kidney uh, histology to ascertain that there was no tumor. I then handed over this mutation to one of the PhD students at Sanger at the time, Tim Correns, and asked, can you find more mutations? And this is what he came up with. So this figure here, what it shows you is mutations on the x-axis, just numbered by decreasing VAF. And then on the y-axis, we've got five tracks. In red, the tumor, and then the two normal tissues, pelvis and blood. And what we are measuring is the variant alley frequency. So what we find in all samples are germline mutations that have a VAF of about 0.5. Then we find post-zygotic mutations, so early embryonic mutations that are shared between all tissues, however, are present at a non-heterozygous VAF. On the far right, we see tumor somatic mutations, 
and then in the middle, those three mutations, the needles in the haystack that represent a bit of normal kidney that is related to a tumor at a very high valve. So almost every cell in that biopsy that we sequenced is related to the tumor and it precedes tumor development. So we extended our study into more cases and other assays. And what we found in a cohort of about 20 children, half of them do harbor these clonal expansions in normal tissue. Mechanistically, this was driven by hypermethylation of H19, which is a very, very well-established oncogenic driver event of Wilms tumor. So in other words, a sizable proportion of children with Wilms uh, harbor these normal tissue precursors, which are non-transformed non seeds of the cancer itself. Now, this finding had three major implications. The first is that we might be able to explain the predisposition of some children who have got cryptogenic syndromes. So this would be an example here. This was a young toddler who had a Wilms tumor on the left side and an ipsilateral enlarged leg. It had been through multiple rounds of testing by our clinical geneticist and a cause for that overgrowth could not be found. A re-sequenced tumor and a nephrogenic rest which was situated at the other end of the kidney at the upper pole and some adjacent normal tissue and reconstructed the phylogeny. What we found is, and that's, this is absolutely extraordinary, that the nephrogenic rest and the tumor, highlighted here with a yellow bar in the red lineage, have a common precursor in the piece of normal uh, kidney, which is defined by two mutations, and then each has got a private branch. And again, here we find hypermethylation of H19. So what this child has is a post-zygotic but pre-gastrulation hypermethylation of some embryonic cells that gave rise to one quarter of this child's body and underpin this syndrome of a large, uh, a large kidney, a tumor, and a nephrogenic rest and overgrowth. The second thing that these findings did is they provide direct evidence of the embryological seeding of Wilms tumor and give us some idea of the timing. So this is another case. This is a child with bilateral tumors. We sequenced multiple tumors on the left, multiple tumors on the right, and then reconstructed the phylogeny and had some normal tissue as well from each side. And what we found here is, so bilateral uh, Wilms tumor, if you think about it, the, it could be the case that one tumor goes from one side to the other or they're independent. But what we are showing here is that these tumors originate from a common precursor because the, that lineage is present on both sides, we can make the statement that this would have occurred before gastrulation. And here I'm just giving you a sense of how crystal clear the data is. If you look at this heat map here, which shows the variant alley frequency of the key mutations, one doesn't need to apply difficult computational methods to reconstruct the phylogeny here. And third, and this is perhaps the most important point that I make is, that by finding a precursor of a childhood cancer, we could at least begin to raise the question of screening and prevention without sounding utterly deluded. Encouraged by this finding, we set out to apply our approach to other tumor types, including bilateral neuroblastoma, malignant rhabdoid tumor, and infant leukemia. Bilateral neuroblastoma is an extraordinarily rare presentation of neuroblastoma, which is a reasonably common neuroquest-derived uh, embryonal cancer in our practice. The key question that we have from a clinical point of view about uh, 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 bilateral neuroblastoma is whether the tumor on each side, whether they're the same or whether they're different from a molecular genetic perspective, that matters because the somatic genetics of neuroblastoma define risk and thus treatment intensity. From a scientific embryological perspective, it is a fascination to ask and to consider whether these tumors originate from a common precursor or are independent primaries. So what we had found in Wilms tumor is the upper scenario there where both tumors on the left and the right arise from a common precursor and if we look at data, the way that presents is that we find post-zygotic mutations shared between tumor and blood, but then we also find mutations that are shared between the tumors, as I had shown you before. The alternative is that tumors could be completely independent, so what we would find is we, thought we would not find shared mutations between the tumors, 
and we may be able to find post-zygotic mutations that are exclusive either to the left or the right lineage. So we looked at a couple of cases, and I'm showing you here data from one particular child. You can see an MRI image of the tumors up there in the corner. We reconstructed the phylogeny, and what we found, and the key figure to look at is C here, is a scenario where we do find post-zygotic mutations, so free variants that are shared between blood and the tumors. Well, that is probably the length or the time, the embryonic time that these tumors evolved along the same lineage, and then they're completely segregated. They do not share mutations, and moreover, they segregate so strongly that the left tumor has a, uh, a phylogenetic connection to blood, but not the right tumor. What is then extraordinary here, that these tumors evolve in highly parallel ways. So if you look at D and look on chromosome seven, you can see that both chromosomes gain chromosome seven. But extraordinarily, one tumor gained chromosome seven from mother, and the other gained chromosome seven from father. And that parallel evolution goes on and on and on. And here's another quite striking example that both tumors lose uh, 19P somatically. This is to generate a second loss of smark a 4 which the child had as a germline mutation. So the clinical conclusion from this is that we cannot assume a tumor on one side to be the same as the tumor on the other side. And from a phylogenetic view, what we are seeing here is a generation of the same developmental aberration, a neuroblastoma occurring twice in the same body through segregated lineages. So the hypothesis that derives from this observation is that, barring chance as an explanation, the underlying germline predisposition was so strong to lead to tumor formation twice, and this then raises the exciting prospect that the steps leading to childhood formation are preordained, given a certain germline genotype, and therefore perhaps something that we may be able to interfere with. I'll talk about one more sample, uh, one more example from our research, malignant rhabdo tumor. So malignant rhabdo tumors, they're probably amongst the rarest tumors that we, we, we uh, uh, deal with as pediatric oncologists. There are probably about four children in the UK that, uh, that, that have this tumor. It is one of the most aggressive childhood cancers, and the majority of these children do not survive. It typically affects the kidney, but can arise anywhere in the body, including in the brain, when it is referred to as atypical teratoid rhabdo tumor, in case that's the term that rings a bell. Um, it is thought to arise from the neural crest, and is genetically highly unusual in that it is driven by only one single driver, and that is by allelic inactivation of smark a one in 95% of cases and in 5% of smark a 4 which is a related gene. And in about one-third of children, one of the mutations is present in the germline. The starting point of our investigation was this case here sent to me by my collaborator Jano Drost from the Princess Maxima Center in, in the Netherlands. He had sent us tumor, blood, and normal kidney hilum, and we wanted hilum because that is where the neural crest-derived ganglion and Schwann cells reside and that's thought to be the origin of MRT. We performed whole genome sequencing, and this is what we found. So what you see here is a reconstruction of the lineage using the kidney parenchyma, blood, tumor, and hyalur biopsies. This particular child had a germline mutation present that's indicated in the red bar. The mesodermal lineages, kidney parenchyma, and blood then segregate, and in the neural crest slash tumor lineage, the second hit is acquired. Now, what this data showed here is that if you look at the second H&E picture, there is a bunch of Schwann cells, and according to the data, 80% of those Schwann cells has lost the second copy of Mark B1, and is highly related to the tumor. So there are neural crest-derived Schwann cells in this particular biopsy that had not transformed and that were not cancerous. I did not believe the finding and assumed that the student must have gone something, uh, something wrong in terms of mixing up samples. So I said, just forget about it until we have another case. About one year later, we had the very sad opportunity to obtain tissues from another child, a young girl who died from MRT within a few days of presentation. She had a very unusual tumor situated in front of the spinal cord but outside the brain. 
Following her death, her parents had somehow got wind of the fact that I did research and approached me and asked me whether post-mortem material would be helpful for my research. We thus embarked on a limited post-mortem to sample the tumor and surrounding normal tissues, and much to my astonishment, we found the same picture again. There were normal, so in the ventral and the dorsal ganglia of this child, there were normal Schwann cells that had lost both copies of Mark B1. So we couldn't really ignore the finding anymore and did what we had to do, which is the definitive validation. Now, in clinical practice, the way we diagnose malignant rhabdoid tumors is to do staining for the SMARC B1 protein. SMARC B1 is very unusual. It is ubiquitously expressed in every single cell of the human body. And the way that we diagnose these tumors is to show that there is no evidence of the protein, the INI1 protein, in tumor tissues. And this is what I'm showing you here, going back to the kidney case. At the bottom, this is what uh, any one staining normally looks like, the SMARC-B1 protein in normal Schwann cells. At the top, we look at a biopsy which, according to our data, had retained one copy. And then and the, the key finding is that middle one, those Schwann cells which are any one negative, so they had indeed lost both copies of SMARC-B1. So what follows from this is that whilst inactivation of smarc b one is a feature of all rhabdoid tumors universally and all the time, biallelic inactivation of smarc b one even when mutated in the right compartment, and here we are talking about neural crest-derived Schwann cells, will not invariably lead to cancer formation. So these observations then lead us to asking a very different set of questions about rhabdoid tumors that may lead us to the answer what generates these tumors. What we now need to ask is, why are smarc b one null normal tissues, not cancers in these children? And what is it that pushes the cells towards transformation? Is it an epigenetic event or is it just chance? However, if it were mechanistically driven, there might be a way of secondary prevention of cancers in children predisposed to rhabdoid tumors. So I'm going to stop here with example on my, examples of my work on childhood can, uh, cancer. And in the interest of getting you to your lunch break, I'll skip a few slides. I just want to return finally to this bit here, that question of the first cell division. Since seeing that asymmetry in our data and learning about Marta's experiment, I was quite itching to do a definitive experiment in humans. And the way this would work is we would study some cell lines derived from the fetus and placental tissues and ask the question, what is the phylogenetic relationship between these? We were only able to do this last year and close the circle in a collaborative piece of work conducted with Gordon Smith and Steve Charnock Jones from the Cambridge based Predicting Outcomes of Pregnancy Study, POPS. We looked at the genetic landscape of human placentas along with umbilical cord tissues representing the inner cell mass. And this enabled me to directly study the contribution of the derivatives of the cell division, first cell division, to placenta and embryo proper. And that's shown here. So we find the mosaic mutation that has got the highest VAF, and then ask what is the VAF of that mutation in, in, umber, in placental tissue versus the umbilical cord. And from that, we can get a sense of the contribution of the first cell division to embryo proper and placenta. And what we found is exactly what we had observed in mice from data. It's exactly what Magda had observed in her uh, in vitro labeling experiments. And from some other indirect data in humans here, the direct observation that there's this two-third, one-third split. Now, what is really fascinating about this, that in some cases, for example, here on the far left, the data was consistent with a complete segregation of early embryonic lineages. Such separation may serve as clonal bottlenecks through which cells may be excluded from the inner cell mass. And if we think this a little bit further, this might then provide that genetic bottleneck that is required to segregate the embryo from abnormal cells, which is, for example, something that we observe in, in placental mosaicism or when a trisomic uh, fertilized egg is rescued by putting the disomic derivatives in the embryo and the trisomic derivatives into the placenta. So I hope I have been able to enthuse you about phylogenetic reconstructions of human development, which I think provide a very powerful approach to studying the black box of normal and abnormal 
human development. The ambition of my research is to describe across many different examples of childhood cancer the clonal dynamics of normal tissues which may ultimately build the scientific basis for screening and prevention. Now what is left to say here is an expression of gratitude towards the many individuals and friends who have supported me with my inquiries. So the first person that I would like to thank is Mike Stratton, the director of the Wellcome, Trust, uh, Wellcome Sanger Institute, who was my doctoral supervisor. Mike rescued me at a very distinct low point of my career when I simply did not know what to do. And at that critical juncture, he sort of lured me into the labyrinth of the human genome and taught me how to explore and harvest the richest of this treasure trove of our natural world. I am incredibly grateful to all the people who have worked and collaborated with me, and in particular my colleagues in the NHS, who at the end of the day are the people who entrust me with studying their patients. And I've got a wonderful group uh, of scientists that I lead at Sanger, whom I would like to thank for the hard work and the banter. And finally, I'm indebted to the children and families who participate in my research. It is these children that I owe my findings to. Thank you very much. Questions for Sam? While you think about it, I'm going to give him his envelope. Many congratulations. Thank you very much. Hi, Sam. That was lovely. Um, for your, your SMAD1 negative cells that look normal, could they be on the way to becoming abnormal? Is it just a, a snapshot that the time you're looking at them, they haven't yet become a tumour? That, that is possible. The, so you are right. Another way of looking at them is they've completed maturation. And I think the, there's a little bit of evidence from mice. So they're quite interesting mouse models of this. So people have tried to make raptor tumors in mice for many years. There's a French group that has come up with this system where unless you knock out SMARC-B1 during whatever period of mouse development it is, you get not tumors. And, and all of that evidence is sort of inconsistent with this idea. Everything that we think we know about the raptor tumors is that they form before the tissues have fully matured. But you are raising a very Im interesting point. My hunch is that they, are, they have complete maturation and they wouldn't go on to make tumours, but you are right. I mean, that could be an alternative explanation, which would be even scary, I think. Petra. I, I have, I don't know if this is on, I have uh, probably quite a naive question. So this data which suggests anemic unequal contribution of uh, uh, cells following the first uh, cell division in the embryonic development. So d how do you envisage that, actually, the interpretation of what you see? Do you think it's, there is some kind of active sorting during, you know, at the blastocyst uh, development, or you think the extra embryonic tissues are more permissive? So that's a question of selection, so to say, rather yeah. than active. I think that there are two answers to the question. The first bit of establishing the asymmetry. So in Magda's experiment, what she very beautifully showed is it just seems to depend on where the sperm hits the egg, and that generates some sort of asymmetry that is then propagated, probably in terms of how transcription is, is conducted within the fertilized egg. And then in terms of how are these cells pushed out of the embryo, it is very, un I mean, I would find it extraordinary if Mother Nature had developed a mechanism of scanning the genomes of scales, cells and then having an active mechanism of sort of pushing them out. I think a more plausible idea would be that once, let's say, an additional copy of a chromosome is present, that the cell division is a little less synchronized and that is enough to be pushed out into the sort of outer boundaries of the embryo away from the inner cell mass. I suspect it'll be something quite passive. I would find it unbelievable if, if Mother Nature did that in an active way. Good. When I was a graduate student, I uh, was sitting in my office at Yale and read a review and subsequently a set of papers that summarized and produced evidence from mammals. These are papers published in 1984 
It showed that the set of autosomes that one inherits from one's mother functions differently from the one the set inherited from father. The two sets of chromosomes from mum with none from dad resulted in embryonic lethality and uh, with uh, virtually no uh, extra embryonic tissues. And the ones from when you have two sets of chromosomes from dad and none from mum result in um, very poor development of the embryo proper and a relatively expanded uh, trophoblast. So the work showed that despite the two uh, uh, chromosome pairs being hom homologues of each other and being to all intents and purposes genetically identical, um, the parental homologues were not functionally equivalent. So the fact that something non-genetic uh, with um, uh, could be inherited and cause differences in the behavior of the two parental chromosomes, two parental sets of chromosomes, the two parental genomes, with such a profound effect on phenotype, something non-genetic, blew my mind. I mean, I was completely smitten. Um, so the work discovered in those 1984 papers uh, uh, is an epigenetic process, and it's called uh, genomic imprinting. So Mendel, uh, Medal and Lecture is uh, uh, honors, of course, the person who we're celebrating today, um, Mendel, and is given usually on alternate years to an internationally distinguished geneticist. Uh, the Mendel Medal is entirely within the gift of the president, which is me. <laughs> and uh, for me, um, uh, the discovery of genomic imprinting uh, was uh, a no-brainer, and it had to go to the discovery of genomic imprinting. Um, uh, it was a no-brainer with one caveat. The Mendel Medal and Lecture is given to a distinguished geneticist. And here in front of me, I have two distinguished geneticists, um, uh, Azim Sarani and Davor Salter, who uh, independently, uh, uh, through beautiful embryological studies, uncovered uh, this functional non-equivalence of parental genomes. I also want to acknowledge uh, the genetic work of Bruce Katanach, uh, who through beautiful genetic experiments also showed that the two parental sets of chromosomes in particular regions of the genome were functionally non-equivalent. So today, uh, the Genetic Society has chosen to award the Medal, Mendel Medal and Lecture to two distinguished developmental geneticists, um, both uh, professors uh, Davor Salter and Azim Sarani. And it's especially appropriate this year because we're recognizing not 100 years of Mendel, but 200 years of Mendel. Uh, 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 of, of Mendel. And so it is a, a, a special and unusual time. And those who know me know that I love to break the rules. So uh, uh, I'm really delighted uh, to be um, um, standing here uh, celebrating um, the Mendel medals and Mendel lectures. Uh, on the real um, conceptual advances that the work of Azim and Davor um, uh, has made, uh, have made to the uh, field of developmental genetics and our understanding of genome function and our understanding of the epigenetic control of genome function. So what we're going to do, because this is a bit odd and there's two, uh, so we're going to, um, uh, Avor, Davor is going to go first um, uh, and we'll take some questions from Dav for Davor and then, and then, uh, and then Azim after that. Um, so if I can just introduce Davor first. Um, he uh, received his uh, MD and PhD from uh, the University of Zagreb in Croatia and uh, in 1973 moved to the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia uh, where he was there for several years and it was there he did the seminal work on genomic imprinting. In 91, he was appointed to the uh, director of the Max Planck uh, Institute of Immunobiology uh, in Freiburg, where he stayed for, for 17 years. And then from 2008 and 2014, he moved to an A-star position in Singapore uh, um, uh, at the Institute of Medical Biology. Uh, and currently, he's a visiting international professor at the Sri Raja Center of, for Excellence in Stem Cell Research uh, in Bangkok. Oh, my iPad keeps doing this. So, um, in addition to his work on genomic imprinting, Davor has done 
some remarkable work uh, uh, before that actually on, um, on the cell biology of the early embryo um, uh, and subsequently um, a lot of work on the milieu of the pre-implantation embryo and its importance uh, in regulating um, early uh, developmental decisions, uh, biology and genetics of teratocarcinoma, carcinoma, biology of embryonic stem cells uh, and cloning and, uh, and genome reprogramming and activation of the embryonic genome. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you here, Davor, today. Uh, he's going to give a talk entitled Embryos, RNAs, Retrotransposons, etc. Many congratulations, Davor, for being uh, one of our medal, medal winners today. Thank you. Now you will have a generational change from the set of previous speakers, and we are a little bit old, a little bit slow, so I hope you will accept it, all the, our failures. Um, in, in, I guess in everybody's scientific life, you, you kind of, well, if it is long, you can discern different strings of uh, research and different strings of interest. And they sometimes work that you do something and then for many, many years, nothing happens and then you do something else along those lines and so on. And so what I'm going to show you today is one, <clears throat> one such strings which uh, sort of eventually leads to imprinting, but it didn't start like that. Um, I have to, since I was given this new computer, I have to figure out how to move the slides forward. That, that should work. No. Not that, not that. That should work, no. This should work, maybe. No. As anybody see, knows, oh, that one. That one would be good. It's not. not that one, but should be. There it is, there it is. Uh, I like to thank people in the beginning so I don't forget them. Uh, Barbara knows who is actually here. Actually, you will see she, she was probably main character in most of the work which I will show, and I was a little bit secondary. And as you also see from these years, it stretched about 40 years, uh, time in three different places, in Vistar Institute, Jackson Lab, and in the A-Star. And I listed only people from these labs who actually did real uh, experiments, which I'm going to show. <clears throat> so when in 72 I came to Vistar, uh, I was a kind of the resident early mammalian, early mouse developmental biologist, and since the institute had a big interest in viruses, they told me, okay, you are going to work on interaction of the mouse embryos and tumor viruses, for example, SV40, and that's what we started sort of putting mouse embryos together with SV40 and then look, doing electron microscopy to see what will happen. And uh, immediately we realized that actually, no, you see, that's a problem. Good. Yeah, it should click on there, yeah. All right. Let me just try that one. Yeah. Okay. You should always go forward and back on those. Good. Okay. Uh, we very soon realize that if you just take a mouse embryo without any viruses and look into it, you will see that mouse embryo is actually full of... That's interesting. You can show it on the screen, but not on the, ah, there it is. 
you can see that mouse embryo is actually full of viruses, even if you didn't put any virus in the contact with the embryo. And then I actually remembered that I saw a paper by Patricia Calarco in which she mentioned that there are some strange particles in mouse embryos. And these are the endogenous retroviruses, which we call today eta particles, which bud from the endoplasmic reticulum and also bud from the uh, nuclear membrane. And in addition to eta particles, we also saw this very unusual for that time viral particle, which are C-type particles, which are truly endogenous mouse tumor viruses like Moloni leukemia is C-type particle. And you say, okay, well, strangely, in my early mouse embryo, this is Tusa stage or uh, zygote, viruses are, appear, they are activated. By the time the mouse embryo become blastocyst, they are mostly gone. So why are these viruses in early mouse embryo and what do they do? And that was a moment of wonder and forgetting it. Nothing happened for uh, quite some time, probably for 10, 20 years, until uh, we could approach this issue once again. When Barbara and I went to Cosmic Harbor to do a sabbatical, the purpose was we are going to make cDNA library from pre-implantation mouse embryos and we are going to study the gene expression in all stages and discover the genetic control of mouse development. And the thing we had to face at that time, now I'm talking 87, that for the amount of uh, RNA in order to make a cDNA library, we calculated that we need about two to 300,000 mouse embryos. And though I'm pretty good in collecting mouse embryos, two to 300,000 was obviously beyond our capacity, which anybody working with mouse embryos realize this is not sea urchin that you can just get a bucket of them. So what we spent actually a year doing there is trying to improve. The only thing we saw that we could improve is the plasmid transfection efficiency. And we actually, by fiddling with transfection in the DH10 bacteria, we improved it by order of magnitude. So from 22 to 300,000, we went to down to 20,000, and that I considered feasible. And we made cDNA libraries and then we sequenced cDNA libraries, uh, the ESTs, uh, uh, expression uh, uh, fragment, and used that as a gene discovery. Uh, you who now today works with single cell RNA seq, you would sort of say, why didn't you guys wait it until e e easier ways came, but we didn't wait so. This is the uh, library which we made, the amount of ESTs which was sequenced and then it was analyzed. And now I will spend about 15 minutes talking about one gene which we spend a lot of time working with. And this gene is called spindlin. The reason why it's called spindlin is that Though the protein is very abundant, all this brown stuff is spindling protein, is very abundant in all sites. Uh, it is uh, very remarkable that it uh, covered the entire spindle in this uh, uh, fully grown oocyte. But what was interesting is that when we did the northern blot using <coughs> open reading frame as a, uh, as a uh, probe, we saw that there is three messages of different size. And more interesting, when you look at the behavior of these messages in the 
full-grown oocyte, ovulated oocyte in one cell, you see that suddenly this particular message, the medium-sized message, uh, changes the size from full-grown oocyte to ovulated oocyte. And uh, 4.1 mRNA behaves a little bit differently. It's the size goes down in ovulated oocyte and increases in fertilized egg. And this is the behavior which we recognized that it has been described in frog embryos and characterized to great extent by Joel Richter, that this is the behavior of the messages which are rendered deadenylated in oocyte. And deadenylated message is very stable and it cannot be translated. And it sits in oocyte until the whatever change happens during after fertilization, the message become adenylated and translatable. And this is what happens with the spindling message. So we have the, the crucial element necessary for that. You will realize these three messages, the, the small one has only polyadenylation signal, but the uh, medium-sized message and the large message have a so-called CP element, cytoplasmic polyadenylation element, which makes possible this change in the size. And I will briefly show you kind of molecular basis of it. You don't need the details. So this is the message as it is in the unfertilized oocyte. And the way it all works is that there, there is many proteins involved, but the only relevant is the CPEB, which is binding protein to cytoplasmic polyadenylation site, which sequence is given here. And then several proteins attaches to CPEB, which finally ends up attaching to the five prime end of the message. And this loop uh, inhibits basically any elongation factor and inhibits translation. And this message is then stable, sitting there until the fertilization happens, at which moment the protein, the CPEB protein becomes phosphorylated. It seems that phosphorylation does more practically all the necessary good work in the molecular biology. As a consequence, masking releases the elongation factor, and in the same time, all these guys here extend the poly A tail from maybe two, uh, 20 or 30 po uh, ad uh, adenines into two, 300, which is standard for a normal message. And at that point, this RNA can be translated and made into protein and degraded. And if you think about it, this is very clever thing to do. You need proteins to be used after fertilization, and it's certainly much easier to have a stored message. But if you store message in oocyte, this message is going to be degraded. So nature invented a method how you can store the message, keep it untranslated, undegraded, and then immediately upon fertilization, you have an abundant source of creation of new protein without any translation, uh, transcription. Okay, so that was the <clears throat> three prime end of spindling. But the uh, most relevant for us is actually five prime end of the spindling gene. That we, when sequence spindling, we saw that there is a, let's call it standard gene, which is shown here uh, with the ATG, AUG standard site, start site. And inside the third intron, <coughs> there is a, a retrotransposable element. 
and this retransposable element sequence is completely in synchrony with the remaining axons. There is AUG start site, and when you look into the expression of these two different messages, this is the one message during the development. The, come back. the message which is regulated by the transposon is expressed in full-grown oocyte and during early, very early development. This is now 12 hours after fertilization. Uh, after fertilization, the, uh, sorry, the two cell stage, and by the eight cell stage, this message is gone. However, the conventional message, the one which bypass the insertion of the trans retrotransposon, is expressed throughout development. In, it's expressed in all other adult organs. So the retrotransposon co controlled message is present only during very early development and never in any organ afterwards. Okay, so this uh, type of regulation I don't think was seen before that. And I will now expand on that, but before that I would like you a few words on the possible function of spindling. Now spindling, obviously in 90, to 93, when we were working on it, was a completely unknown gene. Today, spindling is fairly well-known gene, investigated a lot. It has a Tudor domain. It's probably, it was shown, uh, none of it I did, or we did. Uh, it is um, uh, controlling uh, ribosomal RNA synthesis. It is maybe involved in uh, uh, tumorigenesis as an oncogene. People are making small molecules to inhibit it and so on and so on. But I don't care any about any of it. What I care is about what it does in early embryo. And the little hint what it does is finding that the a spindling protein is phosphorylated by the series of phosphorylation steps. I uh, just concentrate on this part. The gels are a little bit hard to read. So we have a, a serine threonine kinase, which uh, phosphorylated uh, serine in the five, in the end terminal of the protein. And then there are also two tyrosine in the end terminal, which was phosphorylated by MAP kinase, 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 which we assumed is MOS. The CMOS is one of the uh, uh, endogenous uh, uh, oncogenes present derived from Moloni virus. And the reason why we suspected that it was CMOS and why we use MOS minus minus mice to show that these two phosphorylations are dependent on presence of MOS kinase is that I remember two papers who appeared a couple of years before that people knocked out CMOS and very they were probably expecting not to see any tumors. But what happened is that this mice had a ovarian tumors, ovarian teratomas, and uh, they noticed also very much parthenogenetic development going on. And this ovarian tumor, ovarian teratoma, were derived from parthenogenetically activated eggs. Uh, well, some of you will know how much I was interested in teratomas. And uh, I found this, and in mouse, ovarian teratomas are not very rare. They do not exist, except for one very unique uh, LT mouse strain, which Stevens described. So the appearance of why in CMOS minus mice you would have suddenly parthenogenesis and ovarian teratoma, uh, we thought maybe it is due to the absence of spindling phosphorylation 
which in absence of this uh, kindness is happening. And there is one small evidence that that can be the case. So if you look here, um, well, come on, help me. So you see here normal eggs, and you here see the eggs in CMOS minus female, and as you can see, there is a, there are chromosomes, and there is presumably spindling, spindle, but there is no decoration of spindle by the uh, spindling. It's completely absent. So the spindling protein is present, but when it's not tyrosine phosphorylated, it doesn't bind to spindle. And so what we assume that what's happening is that's interesting. A uh, message which you cannot see is say Microsoft PowerPoint is not responding. <laughs> <laughs> which I'm going to try to make a go away. Not successful. I knew that I should never accept being on the other computer. Should I do it for you? Yeah? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Anyhow, what I want to show you is the idea that because of the absence of phosphorylation, this phosphorylation is absolutely necessary for spindling protein to bind to spindle. And in the absence of it, spindle is destabilized and results in the parthenogenetic activation. Let's go one slide back. And in the absence of that, the spindle will not be stabilized and so it will, pro I mean, normally there is a, a, how to say, when ovulated oocyte is in the metaphase two stage, uh, it sits there forever if you don't fertilize it. And then it proceeds. So this one, parthenogenesis normally happens if this is not working and the oocytes proceed into parthenogenesis. Okay, and one slight support for that idea is that, as I told you, in mouse, parthenogenesis is not present and ovarian teratomas are absent. However, in human, ovarian teratoma, benign tumor, is very common tumor of young women. And when we looked at the spin, spindling gene in humans, Everything is there, all exons are there, everything is defined except mouse transposon, which is necessary for this phosphorylation in human is not present. And actually the transposon driven message is absent in humans and absent in rabbits and it presents only in rodents and it's unique rodent feature in rats and mice. All right, so now, we will remember that we like the spindling and we're interested in spindling because of this peculiar fact that there are two kinds of messages, maternal message, which is the one driven by the transposon and the somatic message. Maternal message stop being expressed past early cleavage and somatic message is present throughout development and in adult organs. And then we looked, are there other genes of that kind? And very soon, using our libraries, we found several genes of the same type. And here you see the expression of the message driven by the transposon and the not driven by the transposon. And you can see that in each case, their behavior is different. And interestingly, for example, there are genes which only transposon-driven message 
is present in pre-implantation development in its absent. And now when we looked at the series of genes, we can see, and in this case, uh, let's go to the simple slide, the red one is the insertion of that retrotransposon element. And you can see the whole series of genes where the retrotransposon is inserted in different places. And it, what now one of the ulterior motives of me giving this lecture is that we identified some genes, but probably today technology would enable us to, or enable you, not me anymore, to identify all such genes. The problem is that it's not, you cannot do it just by system biology and sequencing. You have to then have to go to each single one of them and determine is it really express two messages, both in development, and then what we were always hoping to do with Spindlin and somehow never got around to it, would you then kindly delete, which is with CRISPR today would be very easy, delete this element, prevent expression of the, because we want to know there are so many human genes with the insert of retrotransposon, and there are so many mouse genes. What do they do? What is the function of message which is driven by retrotransposon? So if you would kindly remember one thing in this lecture, uh, it would be good to sort of sort that out because I have impression that right now nobody has any interest in it. I also wouldn't mind if somebody would remove two trionines, uh, sorry, tyrosines from the end terminal of spindling and see how would this affect development if you cannot phosphorylate on the tyrosine, which was another thing we wanted to do and never got around to it. Anyhow, to finish retrotransposon story, I just want to show you two slides which clearly show expression of different endogenous types of, I mean, uh, if you ever read this retrotransposon paper, you will see that people made the classifications which are endless. I don't know what they mean, but there are de many, many classes of transposons and endogenous retroviruses and interestingly, very early in development, this class of mouse transposon is uh, part of the 10% of all ESTs which we found in the uh, fully grown oocytes. So it is certainly major part of expressed genome. In 10% of all the expressed messages in full-grown oocytes contain mouse transposon as a part of it. And to summarize this part, good. Uh, well, you can read it yourself, but one really important point is that they are expressed in this early development, I'll come to that later, that it is possible that insertion of the retrotransposon L or LTR create a new gene, a new function, which is different from the original function, and they might serve as a reorganization and reprogramming. If you are following that literature, you, that, that will not sound novel in any form, that today, there are practically every month another review of retrotransposons and their role in gene, respect, in gene expression. However, when we published that in 2004, I could say honestly it was, cons it was not existent. It was a very bizarre idea. And this is another aspect of 
it's what I call scientific or scientist ecology. Uh, it's probably, sounds silly, not good idea to publish something before its time. So now, when I read about, and you sort of always read uh, on subjects which you did something, when I read something today and say, well, it was clearly shown that uh, expression of many genes during development and in stem cells in differentiation are driven by retrotransposon. The references are usually from 2012, 2014, because it seems that that's how far the short-term memory of people is willing to go. And uh, our 204 paper is more or less in the distant past and needs to be forgotten. Now, if you think about that, what I, this whole piece, what I just told you, you would think, well, this in reality doesn't really make much sense biologically. It, it's not good for the eggs to express retrotransposon and had this retrotransposon going all over the place and inserting in different places and cause mutations and, and this should not be really happening. And then why it's happening during mouse or genesis? And at that time, we proposed the idea that since mice, and I assume humans and other mammals, made this error of eggs adapting retrotransposons to regulate genes, and then once this happened, they, these genes became necessary and then became essential. Now you made this devil's bargain and now you cannot silence retrotransposons anymore because then you will silence your genes which you really need. And we actually very recently, or not recently in, in Singapore, decided to look into the retrotransposon silencing, which is essential feature, for example, for gametogenesis in Drosophila, so that if, you, if the genes involved in creation of silencing mechanism are absent, then Drosophila males and females are sterile. And it's also the case that genes which are essentially for this silencing system, which is, sorry, pi RNA. Also, when these genes are deleted, the males, mouse males, are also sterile. So it seems that in spermatogenesis, you have to silence retrotransposons. So we wanted to see what is going on in females. So, uh, these genes have been knocked out, but they have been knocked out in outbred mice, so we thought that this might be problematic. Who knows wh why, what will happen? So we looked, we transferred these genes. Barbara was really crucial in that, uh, into the in, uh, inbred mouse strain, and then we looked what will happen. And first, you can look for presence of pi RNAs, and you can see that in, so the, basically there are three genes, one, two, three, and different RNA, pi RNAs, normal deletion, normal deletion, normal deletion. You see in every case, I'm using wrong thing. Uh, no, I cannot pick the, forget it, I cannot pick the, marker anymore, but you can see that in every case, the pi RNA is significantly reduced or basically absent. Why don't I can pick it up? All right. No, I did it. All right, then. No, I don't want you. Anyhow, forget it. In each case, 
the expression of when the knockout of this pi RNA is knocked out, in each case, the production of endogenous retroviruses is significantly increased. And these females with a single gene knockout are all fertile and normal. And now the issue was maybe these genes compensate each other. So we went to the trouble to create triple null mutants, which um, in the absence of CRISPR is a very long and tedious job, uh, especially since your uh, homozygous null males are sterile, so you cannot use them. You have to use heterozygous all the time. But if you are patient, you create some triple mutant female, and the triple mutants are all perfectly fine and reproductively normal. So it is quite different. You treat male and female genome, in mice at least, completely differently. You don't silence retrotransposon in mice, in the female mice, and it, it actually obviously necessary that these retrotransposons are active. And this brings me to the end, which now comes, okay, retrotransposons and imprinting. Now, again, going back into history, I remember when we were still, when Probably Azim and I and Jim McGrath and one or two other people were the only people on earth who knew that imprinting exists. I discussed it with Barbara a lot, and she said, I bet you retrotransposons have something to do with it. Only we couldn't figure out how that could be possible and whatever, but somebody gave it a word, and that was Denise, Denise Barlow, who in 93 uh, published uh, perspectives in science in which she kind of guessed on the basis of very limited amount of information about imprinted genes. And at that time, I don't know why, we were all a little bit impressed with the imprinted transgenes. Uh, and using information from impotent transgenes, impotent genes, little bit methylation data, little bit data that retrotransposons are sometimes methylated. She came with this idea that imprinting is um, in some way byproduct of uh, host defense against foreign DNA and that mechanism of this defense is methylation, and that you methylate imprint genes, you methylate retrotransposon. One was derived from the other. Uh, nobody stated which came first, egg or uh, hen. So whether imprinting was first and then retrotransposon, what doesn't matter. That was the idea. And at that time, very little could be done with that idea. Today, and now I hope only nothing bad will happen. Yeah. Today, we have uh, actually pretty good data uh, about this being somehow possible. Actually, uh, there is a set of genes called zinc finger proteins, crab zinc finger proteins. Uh, our uh, president uh, kind of messed with first of them, uh, which are shown clearly that they actually affect the imprinting of imprinted genes. Uh, we also did a little bit with the TRIM28 TRIM28 is a necessary, uh, necessary feature of the action of 
uh, zinc finger proteins. I will show you briefly how it fits in. Uh, so zinc finger proteins bind to DNA in a sequence specific manner and then uh, attract stream 28. And this stream 28 is absolutely essential to attract it because then it attracts methyl transferases and uh, DNA methyl transferases and histones and causes the silencing. And that's how it works. The problem is that our results with TRIM28 and nuclear transfer suggested that, uh, that the, uh, why don't you go, that it can be involved. The issue was always, is it, is it methylation, the establishment of imprinting or methylation is necessary for preservation of imprinting. Is it that whole genome in oocyte and in egg gets methylated? And then after fertilization, the whole genome gets demethylated, but there are specific mechanisms which sit there and prevent demethylation of imprinted genes. And I would suggest on the basis of our TRIM28 result that methylation is preservation of imprinting and not establishment because in the absence of TRIM28, the imprinting happens. Fertilization happens. The egg is completely normal and it's nucleus and imprinted genes, everything is fine, but then you lose imprinting because there is no TRIM28. If you provide it externally, you prevent this loss. So, I am arguing, and then we have to go and ask, okay, so how imprinting works in sperm when these things are all absent? Then idea was suggested that this is med mediated via PRNA, and there is, I think, actually one example of imprinted gene in the male, in the spermatogenesis, which is controlled by the pi RNA. And then finally, final question is, okay, imprinting exists in mammals. And now you will say, but retrotransposon exists in every creature. So, if retrotransposons and their silencing were basis for formation of imprinting, then why this did not happen in Drosophila? Why there is no imprinting in Drosophila? So, I think we are still not quite there being able to explain imprinting in reality, and I think we probably have, oh, come on. We probably have more to learn about viruses imprinting. Sorry, I hope you saw my joke fast, and if you didn't, too bad. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for all this fuss. Thank you, Davor. Don't go away. Questions for Davor? I told you, esoteric. So, um, um, the crab zinc finger proteins are vertebrate specific. So, it may be that the other um, organisms can't do it because they don't have crab zinc finger proteins. And you think crab zinc finger proteins must be there for imprinting? Well, they're there for are, preserving. Maybe, they, maybe these other organisms yeah, try to imprint but can't, but can't preserve it. That is possible, but there are clearly, I think, imprinted genes which are fine without involvement of crab zinc finger protein, or we didn't find yet the right crab zinc finger protein to connect with that imprinted gene. It's uh, all possible. We can talk about it some more because there's this relationship between the 
canine trimethylation, the histone modification yes. stuff, and the methylation, and, and, and getting that relationship at an imprint is quite For difficult because it's... Fortunately, important. imprinting is a one thing you, which is still open to endless discussion in difference to many other boring scientific <laughs> subjects which are closed, finished, done, and uh, there is nothing to discuss. Well, that's good. <laughs> Plenty to okay. discuss in imprinting, but maybe for the bar. Um, and we'll, uh, if there's no more other questions from the thing, okay, let's move on to, um, uh, to the next talk. Um, oh, you need to take the computer. Okay, okay, good. Again, I'm just going to say a few words about Azim, who received his PhD from University of Cambridge with um, Bob Edwards, um, pioneer of uh, in vitro fertilization, working on early mammalian de uh, development. Uh, he then moved to the Institute of Animals, it's called Animal Research Station uh, on Huntingdon Road in Cambridge, uh, where he, uh, in 1979 actually, uh, and that was where he did um, his seminal imprinting work. Um, and from there he moved to what's now the Babraham Institute, uh, where he worked until 1992, which was where I postdoced with him, and then moved with him to the what's now the Gurdon Institute, but was at the time the Wellcome CRC Institute of Cancer and Developmental Biology. Um, as he was elected the Mary uh, Marshall uh, Arthur Walton <coughs> Professor of uh, uh, Cambridge University in the Department of Physiology, um, and um, uh, continued, uh, 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 continued uh, working at the Garden Institute and uh, uh, being part of the Department of uh, Physiology also. Um, both Azim and Davor had had numerous awards, some of which they have shared. The um, Rosenthal Award, they've both been, uh, at which they shared with, with uh, Mary Lyon, uh, and also the Canada uh, Gardner Award uh, in 2018, which they both shared. And now this one, which is great. Um, so Azim, after Azim's, uh, uh, Azim's work on imprinting, actually it was always the case that, that he wanted to delve into the germline and you know a bit like Davar was saying, I mean you're sort of you know a slave to the tools that are available to you actually at the time and it's quite challenging. So Azim always wanted to go into the germline because he said that's and that's where it's all happening, it's all about the germline. And after that, uh, after the discovery of imprinting, he waited a few years um, uh, until Mitanuri Saitu came to his lab and uh, has done some wonderful work on the germline, uh, germline epigenetics, germline reprogramming, and now um, more recently delving into um, germline uh, and early development in humans. Um, as he was going to talk today about genomic imprinting, why bother? Why bother? Because Davar says there's still lots to answer. Uh, lots of questions to answer, and perhaps we'll uh, hear more about what those questions might be. Thank you very much, Anne. Thanks for the award. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. I'm actually very nervous because I've never given a talk in front of Anne as chairman. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen from now. <laughs> so, uh, which, this one. Okay. 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 Terrific. I think uh, Davor actually gave you quite a lot of food for thought. Uh, you know, it, it's a complicated business. But I think what I'm going to do is to perhaps uh, take more kind of developmental biologist view of it. Um, so I've, I kind of belong to the Boris Johnson's uh, school of public speaking. A lot of waffle, very little data. So I think just see what, <laughs> see what happens. Um, so what, what I would like to do is um, I'd like to try and convince you that genomic imprinting actually represents a change in the strategy for vertebrate development. It's, been, it's quite important for that. That's, I would like to convince you of that. 
And I think the other thing that it's important for is a kind of notable example, paradigm for advances in epigenetic research. So I think those are two things that are important about genomic imprinting. Now, of course, you know, um, Mendel was not aware, I think, as far as I know, was not aware of epigenetics. <clears throat> Although epigenetics does occur in plant, I know David Balkan is sitting there, so I have to say that. So only one of these zygotes is going to develop to term. Uh, this is a mammalian, these are mammalian zygotes, and one is viable. And what this tells us is that parental genomes in mammals have epigenetic asymmetry. Um, and so that's why you need both parental genomes for normal development. And I think Dalho talked about it and, and Anne actually introduced uh, the subject in an introduction. So we know that when, the, when fertilization occurs, the parental genomes come in with chromosomes that are imprinted with epigenetic information, which they inherit from the germline. And as a result, you have monoallelic expression of some genes, something like 130 odd genes in Euthyrian mammals are imprinted. So on the left, you see two genes that are only expressed when they come from mothers, and two on the right are expressed only when they come from father. Um, and there are various mechanisms involved in described for how these marks are put on and how they are propagated. This is just one kind of an example showing you a control element which is coming, an uh, imprinting control element coming from the mother or the father. The imprinting control element coming from the mother has got methylation mark and the paternal allele does not have it. And in this particular case, <clears throat> the enhancer will interact with the promoter to drive expression of the maternal allele. And this <clears throat> um, domains are actually constructed in a very complicated way. So this is just one example of how imprinted genes are inherited and then transmitted. And Davor actually showed you this slide. So transmission or propagation of imprints from the zygote onwards relies on this uh, zinc finger genes that Davor and Anne actually worked on. So we know something about these genes are coming marked from parental alleles, um, and there are mechanisms which are used for propagating them. Now, how these imprinted genes work, I think what's happened historically is that people have tended to work on individual genes to try and describe what individual imprinted gene does in different cases. Um, here's another way of looking at it. You can look at, we can think about imprinted genes as a, as a collection, as a network, and that this network operates in conjunction with non-imprinted genes in different tissues. And as I mentioned, these imprinted genes are propagated through to adulthood, and you have evidence that, not evidence, but you have information showing you that they can work in, in many, many other uh, situations as well. For example, in the developing brain as well, there's some examples of that. So we know that overall, uh, Imprinted genes have a variety of functions in regulating growth, physiology, behavior, and so on. And that if you have errors in imprinting, there are some diseases associated with it, uh, neuronal disorders, <clears throat> and also uh, obesity, and so on. So what I want to now do is to try and think about how the system might have evolved. And I, <clears throat> I'm not going to give you any kind of definitive answers, but I want to just track it through evolution of uh, mammalian evolution, which is in this slide. So we know that um, <clears throat> if you look at 
genome became printing, it does not exist in egg-laying mammals as far as, as, far as we know <clears throat> from the evidence so far. We see imprinting in marsupials and in eutherian mammals. Um, and so the general view is that it's associated with placentation and viviparity. So that's a kind of a general view of it. Um, now, when we look at marsupials, there are far fewer genes that are imprinted in marsupials. And I think there is no, as far as I know, there's no evidence of the existence of uh, zinc finger genes of the type that Dowell described in marsupials to propagate them. Um, so there might be some other mechanism. So there are some differences between marsupials and eutherian mammals, but currently we have no evidence of imprinting in monotremes, the egg-laying mammals. So it's clearly associated with, with viviparity and placentation. But I think the other thing that is interesting to think about is the differences in very early development. So if you look at the development of monotremes, marsupials, and eutherians, you can see that, um, that marsupials have started to make a unilaminal blastocyst. And you have um, the, the two cell types, the, the pluripotent cells shown in yellow and the tractoderm cells on the outside. So you can see that there's some kind of a beginning of something being may recognize in eutherians. Now, when you come to the eutherian uh, development, you see quite a big change. The first thing is very noticeable is that in the morula, you have cells in the, in, in the inside that are completely enclosed. These are going to form the inner cell mass. Um, so there is some change that is occurring between uh, marsupials and, and eutherians. Now, if you look further into blastocysts and how they are changing between marsupials and eutherians, you can now see here in this slide that you have a clear inner cell mass in eutherians. And there are genes that are being expressed in here which we recognize as very important genes, OCT4, SOX2 nano, and so on. And these are the cells that are used for making embryonic stem cells that a lot of us use. Um, so there are two distinct lineages in blastocysts, very distinct lineages in blastocysts that we see. Um, and what is interesting from the point of view of imprinting is that the inner cells that you see, which are pretty important, the maternal genome has a much more uh, of an important role in their development. And for the outer cells, the tracted cells, it's the paternal genome. So we can see here there's some kind of association. I'm not saying this describes the evolution of imprinting or anything. I'm simply saying there is an association between what we see here in terms of developmental change and, and how the two parental genomes are now working to regulate. And <clears throat> this was the experiment, actually, that Dawa Salter and I did in 1984 which showed that the two parental genomes are functionally different, uh, that the paternal genome is more important for the development of the trophoblast, and the maternal genome for the development of the embryo. So, you know, we can, this was really the very first experiment we started to talk about imprinting. When Dower and I used to meet at various meetings, we, we discussed this and sort of were puzzled by this because it's a very strange phenomenon uh, to have stumbled onto. Now, um, I think what I want to do now is to tell you that this uh, introduction of, if you like, imprinting in the in Eutherian mammals has had other effects. And one of the things which is interesting is that the imprinting cycle has become incorporated into the germline cycle, and it's part of the germline cycle because you have to erase and initiate 
imprinting in the germline. So it's become part of the germline cycle. It's very closely linked now. Uh, this is, this I think is quite an important thing. Now, the other consequence of this is that it requires epigenetic resetting. Um, and there are two epigenetic resetting events. The first one is uh, in the germline, where you have to erase DNA methylation and imprints. And this is a very comprehensive erasure mechanism um, before the onset of um, uh, gametogenesis. So this occurs immediately after germ cells are specified. And then you get fertilization and development, and then you get a second, you have a second resetting event, which you see during pre-implantation development, which is um, before the formation of the blastocyst. So this is the time when, if you have other, if you have a lot of DNA methylation marks on the genome, they tend to get erased at this time, uh, except for the imprints. The imprints are protected. Um, so, so this is this is the germline and imprinting cycle, which are interconnected now, and and I think that the consequence of that is that it requires two epigenetic reprogramming event. And one of the advantages of this would be that it reduces the chances of transmission of epimutations to subsequent generations. Now, there were lots of people interested in information transfer and to subsequent generation. One of the people that was involved in thinking about this was August Feisman. Um, and he put forward this germplasm theory, a theory of heredity. And he, he thought of this as a, that germ cells contain the essence of life and would be passed on from generation to, to the next. And, but the information cannot pass from soma to germplasm. So he was thinking about this germplasm, I guess, as a blob. Uh, you might call it condensate in modern terminology. Uh, so he was thinking like in this way. But I think what you see at the left, on the left hand side, um, put down a number of names like Lamarck, Darwin, they're all thinking about how is information being transmitted. So Darwin was thinking about um, this pangenesis. Mendel actually was closest in terms of understanding that there was packets of information being transferred. And Weissman had this idea that there was some substance important for making the next generation. Because this, this is a little bit too simplistic. Because actually to make uh, mammalian germ cells is slightly more involved than simply passing on this kind of jelly to the next generation. And what it involves is going back to this pre-implantation development. I have to apologize. I don't know where I have pinched this slide from. So if it belongs to you, please tell me and I'll acknowledge you. Um, so here you can see pre-implantation development from one cell to the blastocyst stage. And you can also see here that there's loss of DNA methylation, aggressive loss of DNA methylation. By the time you reach the blastocyst stage, the, the levels of methylation have really reduced quite significantly. Uh, imprints are protected during this period because this is important, they're going to be transmitted after in post-implantation development, and they're going to play a very important role in development. Um, so, so this is the situation, and this is the starting point from which, from this inner cell mass, pluripotent cells, you are going to create both soma and germ cells. So this is um, something that we got interested in. Uh, because everything was happening in the germ line, but we didn't actually know the genetic basis for germ cell specification, which was kind of uh, puzzling. So here you can see what I'm showing you here is that around day 7.5, you see about 30, a cluster of about 30 founder uh, 
primordial germ cells in day, day 7.5. And then after that, they start to migrate. Now, there are only 30 founder population of germ cells. And so this was quite challenging to see how you can use such a small number of cells to try and look for the genetic basis for germ cell specification. And I actually put in a grant to Wellcome Trust and it was completely trashed by these reviewers. Um, but the panel kindly gave me the money, so we did the work. Uh, so the, the experiment that was done was as follows. So we took this embryo around day 7.5, and McLaren had shown that you can detect these founder population of primordial germ cells by histochemical staining for uh, alkaline phosphatase. So the idea was then to, to remove this piece of uh, embryo containing primordial germ cells. So, we, so I said, when I say we, this is really the experiment done by Sheila Barton and uh, Veterinary Sayutu. So uh, this fragment was dissected, single cell cDNAs were prepared, and there was a differential screen was performed. And the first gene that we found was Stella. And we were really excited because it was very specific. It marked the uh, founder primordial germ cells. And I brought everybody champagne. I said, you know, we are going to now show that this gene is really the one that is important for specification of mass primordial germ cells. We did the knockout, nothing happened. So this was not the gene, but it became a very important reporter gene. And we used it in lots of places and lots of other labs to use it as well. But nevertheless, this actually started up the quest to actually identify the key regulators of primordial germ cell specification. In the end, there are, to go very quickly now, there are three key regulators which are necessary and sufficient. PIDM1, BLIMP1, PIDM14, and fe 2 gamma or TFAP2C. So these three genes are absolutely necessary to specify primordial germ cells. And the function is to repress the somatic genes, to induce expression of primordial germ cell genes, as well as pluripotency genes. And what is really very interesting uh, in terms of what I was saying to you earlier is that this network is also important for initiating the epigenetic program, the first epigenetic program that starts in the germline. And there's some evidence showing that the two factors after the three, PRDM1, uh, BLIM1, and PRDM14, play a central role because they're targeting some of the demethylases uh, which promote erasure of H3 K9 uh, dimethylation, which is prerequisite for DNA demethylation to occur. They also do repression of VHRF1, which is important for maintenance of uh, DNA methylation. And the two um, factors, BLIMP1 and PRDM14, actually bind to different, the two different promoters of VHRF1. So they're binding two different promoters. So we think that this might actually be quite important. And, and this then leads to uh, DNA demethylation to continue, um, with repression of also DNA methylation. There's some involvement of TET enzymes as well, that's transient expression of uh, TET. Um, and there's transient increase in 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, and then again you get this erasure of DNA methylation. There are different views about this. Um, uh, but this was uh, the work that Jamie Hackett did in my lab. And so I think what, we, what I'm showing you here, we have seen bits of this also occurring in the human germline. So this then, um, once you start this process of um, reprogramming, um, actually Petra was here, actually was started the work in my lab in way back in 2002, or before that, actually. Um, so you can see that as germ cells migrate towards the gonad, 
you get epigenetic reprogramming, lapello redundant mechanisms. I think there's also some evidence that Petra has that there was base excision repair involved. In any case, there's virtual loss of DNA methylation down very few percent. Um, and that I think the only time the parental genomes lack imprints is in this late primordial germ cells. That's when there are, there are no imprints. So the title of my talk actually comes from actually a paper which was a very provocative paper by Rudy Janisch. And he said it would be surprising indeed if imprinting represented a fundamentally important developmental mechanism. And I it, it think it's rather consistent with imprinting having no intrinsic role in mammalian development. So this is my good friend, Rudy Janisch and colleague. And I think he made one important point in this paper. He said that, you know, if you can create uh, a genome with no imprints, you can get, you can get development because this, this is just something that is crept in and it is not of much value. You can do without it. So what I think what he was suggesting is that if you can do an experiment where you do a nuclear transplantation of imprint-free genome into an egg and you will see a normal development. You can get rid of all this nonsense. So we actually tried this experiment. Um, so we asked this mammalian development possible with imprint-free genome. And the only thing we could do at that time was to use primordial germ cells, because those are the only ones that we could see the later ones lacked imprints. And we did the nuclear transfer experiment. Yoko Kato did this experiment. And you can see on the left, there's the control embryo. And on the right, you have the embryo that is made with the primordial germ cell. It doesn't go very far. Now, the thing is that the way these imprinting uh, um, domains are, are formed is that if you take out imprints, this is what you get. You get loss of some genes, like you see loss of IGF-2, or you get gain of, or you get myelinic expression of some of them. So taking out imprints doesn't actually sort this. Uh, so somehow we are lumbered with imprinting and we have to deal with it and live, live with it. Um, I think it'd be very interesting to do this experiment now, again, using the new technology, you know, using the uh, CRISPR-based epigenome editing to see if we can do this experiment again and make, try to make uh, imprint-free genomes and then do this experiment. Now, you know, I told you that we've, the, the genetic basis for germ cell specification is, is relatively new. I think we started to, to know about this in just around, by 2005 or so, we, had, we knew that there were the key regulators. But there's been amazing progress since then, because now, amazingly, you know, we can break Weissman's barrier because you can make primordial germ cells from somatic cells, from skin cells, and also um, make gametes that are, give rise to viable young. Um, so you can reprogram skin cells. Now, incidentally, uh, reprogramming or making ES cells also doesn't give, uh, lead to loss of imprints. Imprints are protected by and by and large. If, unless you mistreat them, then you lose them. So, um, so this is a really a remarkable work by Katsuhiko Hayashi and Metinori Saito, and they and their colleagues actually produced viable gametes from reprogrammed skin cells. It's quite amazing. You know, it's quite come quite quickly. I wouldn't have predicted it would have this fast. So. Um, I just want to finish off telling a little bit about uh, the human germline, which is the work we've been doing over the last five, seven years. And the reason for getting into this is that you can see that there are differences in, in the way the embryo looks. So you have mass embryo that looks like an egg cylinder, and you have 
human embryos. In fact, most mammalian embryos look like this kind of bililic, bi uh, bilaminal disk. Um, we can't do the same type of experiments in humans for obvious reasons. So we have to use stem cells and make models and so on. And again, this is uh, proved uh, fruitful and we have started and others have been working on this now and to see how germ cell specification actually occurs in humans. So I think what the combined, I, don't, I can't go into all the data, but the combined data is giving some insights into the origin of human uh, primordial germ cells, how the epiblast cells gain competence for germ cell fate, and we're also uh, understanding the mechanism of uh, germ cell specification in humans. And just to give you the bottom line, a big surprise was that human germ cell specification, the regulators, are not the same as in mice. And one fundamental difference is the role of SOC17. A very big surprise because it's a classical gene involved in uh, specification of endoderm. So th this is necessary and uh, absolutely essential, not in mouse. And there are other differences which are not pointed out here. For example, PRDM14, which I mentioned earlier, is very important for mouse germ cell specification, only has a peripheral role in humans. And one of the things that we can relate this to is the difference in the way the embryos look. Uh, Bilaminar disc versus X cylinder. And other mammalian species like pig, rabbit, monkeys, mom said that also have bilaminar disc have the same uh, regulators with SOC17. So th this seems to be uh, quite central and uh, important. So SOC17 is the key regulator uh, and actually the PRDM1 or BLIM1 is a direct target of, um, of, of SOC17 and these two together can induce germ cells. Uh, you see in this next slide if you, if you express incompetent cells SOC17 and uh, LIMP1, you can induce primordial germ cells. So, so this actually shows you the importance of these two genes. Um, there are other kind of um, interesting bits and pieces which um, I won't go into, but I think the other thing that we found is that the gene dosage is very important, that you must, you have to have appropriate levels of SOC17 and BLIMP1. If you have too much SOC17, you will get aberrant germ cells with a lot of expression of endoderm genes because SOC17 is one of the key genes that will upregulate endoderm genes. So the dosage is important in this case. So uh, now I want to kind of wrap up. So we published some recent data on um, primordial germ cell specification network, how the, how the promoters and the regulatory elements interact, which I don't have time to go into. But again, here what we see is this network is inducing uh, early PGC genes, it's suppressing somatic genes, and it's upregulating genes necessary for initiating the epigenetic program. So it's the upregulation of um, Tet enzymes and some DNA demethylases as well. Now, one of the big problems with working with humans, and this is what is a big challenge, we were spending a lot of hours and time trying to, to solve this because we cannot do the kind of experiments we do in mice. So, we have to develop in vitro models. So, what we basically need to do is to go from equivalent of the third week, which is when the PGCs are specified, to around the sixth week, seventh week, when they get into the gonads. And this is the period over which all of the uh, 
uh, all of the um, epigenetic reprogramming is occurring. So that's what we are trying to do, is to try and develop in vitro models using embryonic stem cells. We are also using ex vivo uh, gem cells that we can get from aborted fetuses for verification and so on. Um, so again, you can see on the right-hand side that there is this decline in DNA methylation. We want to try and understand how it's regulated because we know that one of the things we know is that SOX17 is expressed throughout this period during their migration. And we're kind of wondering what role, if any, it has. And we think it does have a role in this epigenetic reprogramming in the germline. Um, and we and others are kind of trying to see if we can make what we call germinoids, that is trying to make uh, primordial germ cells in culture and somatic cells, gonadal somatic cells, combine the two together and see if we can get in vitro type gametogenesis or something. This is kind of the longer term aim. But I think what we would like to do is to try and see if we can get an understanding of this part of the germline development, human germline development, which is very difficult to access because now practically we can get no embryos that are younger than five weeks old. So everything between the third and the fifth week is completely unknown because we have no real access to the germ cells. Even the ex vivo ones are getting quite scarce now. So, we, so the, finally, we don't actually know much about the marsupial germ cells, which would be great. We, um, and Toshi Kobayashi, when he was in my lab, had started doing some work and is now continuing. Uh, he's now back in Kyoto, uh, Tokyo, rather, started his own lab. And you can see this beautiful image uh, of very early post implantation marsupial embryos. This is from Monodephus, uh, it's a lab mouse um, marsupial. And you can see at the bottom of the figure here, PGCs. So they are specified in the posterior epiblast in the monodelphus um, marsupial. But it'd be very interesting to know how they are specified and how do they compare with the youth here. And I think this might tell us a little bit more about how this imprinting might have evolved. Um, I think one thing that we are have been looking at, uh, actually James Turner actually initially gave us some embryos when Toshi was in my lab and he had started doing some work with James. So thanks to James. Um, so this would be really exciting, I think, to know how marsupial primordial germ cells are formed. So this is the summary, a rather long summary. Uh, so I'm trying to answer the question I asked, why bother? I think we should bother because it's a significant change in the strategy for vertebrate development with many advantages. Although we always talk about disadvantages of monolithic expression and you know, diseases, and, but I think there are advantages. I think that the fact that imprinting cycle is integrated into the germline cycle, I think is an advantage because they are now interlinked. They cannot be broken. The two epigenetic resetting events for totipotency and pluripotency is an advantage because you then create an epigenome with fewer epimutations. Now, this reduces the um, inheritance of cumulative epimutations through generations. You reduce that significantly. Now, there's competition and selection of epiblast cells before germline or soma formation. Uh, wonderful work going on at Imperial College uh, on that. Um, so this actually is also an advantage because you select cells. And in fact, the calculations, you need about three cells to make a whole mouse. So this, is, this I think, represents an advantage as well. So the blasts with inner and outer cells have distinct functions um, where the parental genomes we know have got important role to play. 
And I just wonder whether there are other places like where the parental genomes with uh, distinct functions. Potentially in brain development, Sheila Barton and I were doing some chimera experiments of getting the sort of distribution which is not uniform in the brain of the endogenetic and parthenogenetic cells, which has not been followed up. But I think it'd be, I think it'd be very interesting to know whether, whether the parental genomes have this differential role. And I think the, the way I can think about it is that you can think about it, genomic imprinting as an enforcer of functional cooperation of parental genomes. They have to work together because they don't work exclusively to make the inner cell mass or exclusively to make the placenta. They work together. They may have prominent roles, but they have to, they are working together. I've been thinking how to kind of think about this. And so this is what I thought we could call it, obligate genomic mutualism. They have to kind of work together. Uh, and this is something that I'm quite interested in and trying to explore, conceptually at least. Okay, so this is it. So this is my current lab, but I really want to use this to play tribute to Sheila Barton. Um, Sheila actually joined me when I first started my lab. And actually, we had been working together with Matt Kaufman on parthenogenesis um, a few years before that. And we, when we started the lab, we, we kind of were thinking that it may be very interesting to know do you need both parental genomes for normal development? So Sheila was with me for 30 years and is absolutely fantastic embryologist. Very little formal training. She learned through experience. Uh, she's a really a marvelous colleague. So thank you. Questions for Azim? Yeah, Sarah. Do you have a microphone? Uh, Kay's got one. Thank you. Thank you for a lovely talk. Um, I was just really interested in your idea of genomic cooperation. And I was wondering, just conceptually, is there anything that is interesting from the point of view that our species has in the past hybridized with other species. So for example, presumably at some point there was a Neanderthal genome and a modern human genome that somehow cooperated enough. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on what the imprinting was going on was like at that point in time. I have zero idea on that. Uh, I think I'm, I actually talked to a number of people about this. But I think what you, what you bring out is, is very interesting. I, I think it needs more thought, and I think it needs some experimental data. And I think the only thing I can think of at the moment is to see if there is some way of using uh, what we know about the role of parental genomes in the inner cell mass in the trifectoderm, the, the ICM and the trophoblast, to see if you can understand how the two genomes actually cooperate. Because the they're, they're number of imprinted genes are only 130, so they can't do the whole thing. So they're working, they're, they're providing the context in which other non imprinted genes might work. So how actually this works, I don't know. I've, I've only just thought about this about not very long ago. So I'm still in the state of exploration. So I welcome anybody who has ideas or suggestions or criticism. Or if you think it's complete nonsense, please let me know. Too. Thanks. Um, I think there's a question, the question on the chat. Hi, this is from someone online and says, Hi, Azim, uh, this Maharaj, uh, fascinating talk. Is there any implications of imprinting on mammalian health span? On? Mammalian health span. Health span. On what, sir? Health span. 
I guess it's healthy, healthy, healthy oh. aging. Uh, I don't actually know. I wouldn't really doubt. Don't know. Thank you, a really fascinating talk. Uh, I find very interesting this difference between mice and other mammals in the sense from molecular to anatomical differences in development. What do you think are evolutionary or adaptive reasons for this difference? Adaptive reason, I think is again a very tough question. Um, the only thing we, we can relate this difference is to the difference in the way the two embryos develop. But I should also say that there are other molecular differences even in pre-implantation development because the, there are some genes that are expressed in human pre-implantation development which are not expressed in mouse. So I think, although we see this uh, difference in embryos uh, very distinct. There are other molecular differences now. Why the differences occur, I, I don't, don't know. But it does look like when people started looking at different species, it looks like if you have a bilaminar disc embryo, you're going to use SOC17. I don't know whether it's to do with the geometry of the embryo or something else. I'm not sure. Dabur. In connection with that, I would argue that we are evolutionary, very mammals are evolutionary, very new, but comparatively. And that uh, as they were developing, they put different methods to do the same thing. And we didn't have yet time to become uniform in how to do particular thing. I mean, Another comment, what Azim uh, mentioned this old uh, Rudy Yenish's uh, statement how uh, we could probably uh, live without imprinting. The logic of that was that at that time we knew two imprinted genes and, and they, they were IGF and IGF2 receptor, IGF2 and IGF2 receptor and they acted opposite. One was making mice bigger and one was making mice smaller. So Rudy thought, well, if we have a two copies of, instead of one copy of each, if we have two copies of each, they will again be in balance and it's perfectly all right. Obviously imprinting is not so simple. It's not that we have a, a compensatory gene in one genome and in another, and we can just upregulate both genomes, erase imprints, and then we will have two active copies of each gene and it will be just fine. What Azim clearly showed, imprinting, when it's erased, we will end up for some imprinted genes, we will have two copies, which is bad, and for other imprinted genes, we'll have no copies which will be also bad. So the only way, I think, to make a, a non imprinted genome work is to pick up a certain set of genes and knock out one copy so that we would be monolithic for that one and for other to insert a transgene so that we get, and what we will end up is making a pseudo imprinted genome in function we will again have a monoallelic expression of all the imprinted genes, only we will call it now non-imprinted genome. mean, there are series of experiments where people decide that they are going to show how imprinting is not necessary by making a mouse with the two maternal genome, except one maternal genome was manipulated enough so that in terms of function became a paternal genome. And then, so it's, it's not relevant whether something is maternal genome or paternal genome. The only relevant thing is if it's maternal, 
or whatever, female imprint and male imprint. And if you have both, it's totally irrelevant when this, mm -hmm. where this genome is coming from. Yeah, all about dosage rather than parental origin. Um, any more questions? If not, let's pause and give Azim and Davor their medals. Uh, I thank them both for fantastic talks. And then after that, we're all going to go out for photographs. But um, first of all, let me please give um, uh, Azim and Davor their awards together, please. <laughs> up here. Oh. Thank you. Am I allowed to speak? Customary to, to say thank you and to thank other people. And I certainly want to thank Jim McGrath, who did a lot of v mouse nuclear transfer work, and without which I certainly not have imprinting. And I want to thank Barbara. I want to tell you one funny story about Mendel's Medal. When I was a uh, Euro European editor of Genes in Development, that person by ex officio becomes a member of the, whatever you guys have, council or something. And I was, when I was member of that council, we were voting for the uh, winner of the Mendel Medal. And I know that we voted for J James Watson, who got it in 2000. And Barbara and I met Jim in London when he was getting ready to get this medal. And he was complaining how the stingy genetic society would not put him in a hotel where he always stays, which is Savoy on Strand, <laughs> but put him in some other lousy hotel <laughs> which he then refused and went to Savoy. And then I actually looked into prices of Savoy rooms, which are today between 1,500 and 2,500, and thought genetic society was probably right. <laughs> but at the same time, because I was there also as a member of this council, the Genetic Society put us in a hotel, and this was one of these typical London hotels where you have to climb on the bed to open the dresser. So I thought, well, maybe Jim was also right. But what finally I want to say is, this was year 2000. You probably know that uh, famous uh, uh, paper which was uh, implication we were we did not ignore uh, is published in 1953 so Jim had to wait 47 years to get mental medals and Azim and I we only had to wait 38 years <laughs> so we are way ahead I'm sorry it took so long actually uh, on the last point you make, uh, Davor, I think I think I, I was reading Kim, Kim Naismith's uh, article in, in Nature Genetics. I think it's a wonderful account. I think there he said somebody asked Mendel, he said, aren't you bothered that you're not, you, nobody's talking about your work? He said, my time will come. So our time will come one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also want to thank uh, a lot of my colleagues who are here, Wolf and, and Petra and Roz and I, how many people I see. You know, I, I wouldn't be here really if they hadn't, and Harry there, I wouldn't be here if, you know, they hadn't come and done wonderful work and of course this person here, absolutely <laughs> amazing. So thank you very much for this award. It's thank very, you. very. Good, thank you.
Um, we are going to go outside and take a photograph, if a, a group photograph, if that's all right. And then if the cake hasn't melted, which look, it looks wonderful, look at that cake. Um, there are drinks and cakes after the photograph, but you have to have the photograph before you get cake. <laughs>